Hello all. Before I begin, this video is sponsored by the dark side of gaming, brought to you by Swamp Dweller himself. If you find this content interesting, feel free to follow the link in the description below. As humanity evolves and grows, so too does our range of abilities in which we can tell stories. From our ancestors huddled around the campfire telling terrifying experiences to scare impressionable young children away from the darkness, a place where powerful predators lay in wait, to cautionary tales of what happens when we stray from the right path. As time went on, our stories went from purely verbal to written in powerful novels, performed on the stage, heard on the radio waves, experienced on the big screen, and, eventually, into our homes where we surf the web and play our video games. That is the purpose of this new show, to showcase some of the darker stories within the gaming community, the mythos behind our favorite games, and the links to real-world horrors so many of them inhabit. My name is Chelsea Rebecca, I am the co-host of the Dead Meat Podcast, a horror aficionado and a lover of gaming. I'm fascinated by the how and why behind all horror media, and tonight, I invite you to get comfy, stay alert, and prepare to embark on a journey into the dark side of gaming. As a child, I would look out past the shore at the lighthouses off in the distance. Most have been deemed obsolete due to all the progress in technology. Even back then, most of them seemed to exist for the sake of existence. Much like a 40-year-old living in their mom's basement, doing nothing but eating Cheetos and playing video games. But for some reason, people love to come and visit them. Coming from someone who grew up on the coast, though, I can't really appreciate the eyesores. Though it may have had something to do with me never getting into fishing or anything like that, it was just never really something I liked. Despite my mom's insistence that I became a fisher, I just couldn't stand the smell or the waiting. For all the things that I despise about the coast, there was something that I found interesting. See, there's one lighthouse in particular that I have always found strange. When I was younger, sometimes I would sneak out of the house just to stare at it. For whatever reason, looking at the lighthouse was way out in the distance. The one sitting atop an almost man-made looking island. It always filled me with a sense of relief and comfort. I would come up with entire stories in my head surrounding it. It was a top-secret government cell for a giant alien, or an alien spacecraft that landed 200 years ago. I was like six or something at the time, so the stories mostly dealt with aliens. But every time I would stare out at that lighthouse, I would eventually pass out, falling into a deep sleep with dreams of what stories I had imagined. For nearly a year straight, after I started looking out at the lighthouse, I would tell my mom about those stories I had come up with. Every time, she'd tell me in that condescending parent talk that I had an impressive imagination, but I really shouldn't talk about it. She always got nervous and tiptoed around the subject to try and get us talking about something else. Eventually, as I grew up, I stopped bothering with the lighthouse. In all honesty, until about a year ago, it had pretty much fallen into the deepest recesses of my mind, left to the wear and tear of time to sand it down into nothing more than a memory of dust. As I said, I was never much for fishing, and when I moved out of my mom's house, I never really got close enough to the ocean to see it. It very well may have never existed, as far as my memory was concerned, but a year ago, that all changed. One thing you guys need to understand is that living just out of arm's reach of the coast is not the best for finding top-tier jobs. I was able to use some of the savings my grandparents left for me just so I could get by, but eventually pulling just 50 more wasn't an option, and I couldn't get a better job. Having grown up practically entirely excluded from most of the world left my social skills with much to be desired. My social life was pretty much non-existent, aside from a few co-workers, so I got desperate. I started checking newspapers to see if I could pick up a second job or something. I had promised myself it was a last resort, and with my savings empty, along with 20 hours a week making minimum wage, I was pretty sure this qualified. But when I was looking through the newspaper, where I expected to see the same ads I'd seen day in and day out, it had only one. 
It showcased a black background with a white lighthouse, and in big, bold, italicized Comic Sans, it read, Hiring Now, with a phone number along the bottom. I decided to call, and after answering some personal questions, they agreed to interview me. I can't really go in depth into the interview because it's all confidential, but needless to say, I got the job. On the boat ride there, I had some special agent-looking guy to explain the gist of everything. He was wearing a black suit with a white undershirt and a black tie, a pistol strapped to his side, black aviators, and a black Bluetooth in his left ear. He spoke over the sound of the boat in a monotone, accentless voice. As you should already know, you'll be living here until you decide to quit or something else happens. There was a clear implication in his voice. You will have internet access, but certain websites are not accessible. Mostly just social media platforms, as well as a few others that you'll notice as you spend your time here. There is another lighthouse keeper who will show you the ropes. One thing you need to understand, though, is that this is not a typical lighthouse. There's a reason why this is seen as a government's job. I wanted to ask questions, but his mere presence was just too intimidating. You will see things while working here that you won't believe exist if I tell you. That's why we had to run psych tests. We needed to ensure you were fit to handle everything you'll see. He paused long enough that I figured I could ask a few questions. Is that why you asked if I had any living relatives? I asked, with a hint of concern. Yes, anything that may happen to you while you're here will fall on us. To be blunt, we don't want any of your family trying to get money out of us if something happens. He finished. I took a gulp of this salty air as I remembered what had happened way back when. Well, uh, I guess there isn't really any turning back now. He responded in that monotone voice of his. No, you aren't able to put in your two weeks notice for another month. You read and signed all the paperwork. You knew what you were getting yourself into. I said nothing. Neither of us said anything else for the entire boat ride there. All right, hurry out and don't forget anything. I'll introduce you to the other lighthouse keeper, then I will be on my way. As we stepped onto the dock, I noticed that while the islands did have dirt and grass, it was far too square to be natural. Follow me, said the agent, as he walked off towards the lighthouse. I followed him, and eventually we got to the door. He opened the door without knocking and held a hand out, gesturing for me to enter. Bill, are you in here? A gruff, southern voice responded, along with the sound of metal being banged. For fuck's sake, didn't I tell you to knock from now on? As the sound got louder, I noticed a balding old man wearing a plaid, long sleeve shirt and worn jeans coming down the stairs in the center of the room. Well, didn't realize you were bringing me a new one so soon. Presumably, Bill said as he finished walking down the stairs. I now noticed the lump in his lip, as well as his yellow, decaying teeth. Bill, this is our new hire. His name is, um... The agent had apparently forgotten my name. Uh, My name is Xavier. Xavier Corton. They both looked at me as if they both had the same question. Yeah, that's my name. Go ahead and laugh. Neither of them did. Well, Xavier, I'm Bill. Special needs guy, you can go. He said, spitting into a cup in his right hand. It's special agent, the well-dressed man said before heading out the door. Well, kid, you chose a pretty shitty job, but I'm guessing you just wanted the money. He spit again. Uh, Yeah, uh, there wasn't really anywhere else hiring. If it weren't for this place, I'd be homeless. Well, guess I ought to show you around, then. Explain the whole gist of everything, because those numbskulls don't know jack shit. He spit his chew into the cup before setting it down on a dresser at the bottom of the stairs. Down here has the kitchen, lounging, dining room, and all that stuff. And now, if you follow me, I'll show you where your room is. 
We walked about halfway up the lighthouse to where there was a small deck-like area surrounding the stairway, with a railway around it. We stepped onto the deck, and he continued. This is the sleeping area. That bed right there is mine, he said, gesturing to the one practically right in front of us. That one over there is gonna be yours, he pointed to the one on the opposite side. I had to take a few steps to see it. Well, that's convenient, I thought out loud. What is? he asked. Uh, oh, I... Uh, nothing. Just nice to see we can't see each other but sleeping. Uh, you know, because it's just kind of weird and creepy. I responded, a little nervous. Yeah, yeah, we're going to be sleeping at different times anyway. I'll be sure not to interrupt your <clears throat> alone time. His face was dead serious. Anyway, kid, up here is the actual light. We didn't actually have to do anything to keep it going. It's been shining since I started working here. It ain't never gone out. They mostly keep on lookout up here for the things that go bump in the night. What, like monsters or something? I asked, jokingly. Uh, something, he said. You're gonna see some shit, kid. Shit you wish you never knew existed. Never wanted to know existed. But our job is to capture them. The lighthouse brings those things in. We use the tools we got to put them down below. I laughed. Uh, you're, uh, fucking with me, right? His face was stone cold serious. Uh, you're not joking. I let out a breath and felt my face drain of color. So, um, what kind of stuff are we doing exactly? I mean, uh, how do we capture the things if we're luring them in? Follow me, was all he said before walking back down the stairs. I did as he asked and didn't say anything until we got outside. Where are we going? I asked in a panic. I'm showing you where we take the things we get. I kept following him until we approached a lever. He pulled it, and a square chunk of grass moved just fast enough that it moved the grass in a time-efficient manner, but not fast enough to fling it off. It revealed a stairway. Down here is where we take them. Once every couple weeks or so, some guy ports a submarine down here and transfers anything we've collected. I've taken the calling them shades, but... You come up with your own thing, go for it. It's just a general word for anything that ain't human. We reached the bottom of the stairs, and all I saw was a long corridor of cells. Anyway, each one has a hand identifier to open cells. Yours should already be in the program, so everything should be fine. Just put your hand on the pad and select open or close. Then it'll say which option you choose and ask if you're certain and all that. They'll uh, automatically close after 30 seconds, though, so don't go rooting around in the cells. That radio you're gonna get can't transmit out of this cell block because of how thick the walls and everything are. Anyway, we're done down here. I'll show you what you'll be using. I followed him out, then back into the lighthouse. We approached the dresser he had placed the cup on, and he opened it. Technically, they're uh, uniforms, but we don't actually need to wear them. All you really need are these. He handed me a Bluetooth earbud-looking thing, which I promptly put in my ear. And this. He handed me what looked like one of those neck snares people use for capturing wild dogs. You expect me to capture uh, shades with this? I asked in bewilderment. No, dumbass. Come upstairs with me and I'll show you how it's done. I was getting tired of all the walking, but still did as he said. He opened up a cabinet once we reached the top of the lighthouse again and pulled out a pistol, then flicked it around, handing it to me. I've never shot a gun before. He grunted before just gesturing it to me. Fine, whatever. What's the point in having these wire things if we're just going to kill them? We don't kill shades, kid. We injure him just enough so we can capture him. Understand? He said, with an old man groan. So, these are like stun guns, then? I asked. 
Sure, kid. They're like stun guns. Keep it on you at all times. Just don't go shooting me with it. There's a training area out back so you can practice your aim. There are normal guns down there to prep you for the kick. We only got so much of that special ammo. Aside from tat, there's also some weights so you can work on your build. There ain't any slacking going on around here. Shades typically only show up at night, but regardless, you need to be alert at all times. Last thing you need to know, food is rationed. One pack per meal, three meals a day. What about bathrooms? I asked, kind of worried we'd have to use a shit pit out back or something. There's a small side room attached downstairs. It's got a shower and a toilet. He let out a grunt. If you think of anything, just ask. Here, curiosity saves the cat. If you don't know something, never go with your gut. He started walking downstairs. I, isn't there a list of rules or something that I need to follow? I blurted out. Oh, that's on the fridge. I'm gonna be out back. He finished, ignoring anything else I had to say. I decided to check the list of rules, so I headed downstairs. I expected some sort of top-secret list or something, but instead it was handwritten in pencil with multiple eraser marks across it. It seemed to mostly just be where names were written. The rules themselves were nothing out of the ordinary. The only things that were weird were that our restroom breaks, shower breaks, sleep schedule, and eating times were all to the minute. Three twenty-minute meal breaks, five five-minute bathroom breaks, one fifteen-minute bathroom break, a twenty-minute shower break, a seven-and-a-half-hour sleep break, and a single fifteen-minute break for whatever we may want to do. There was also dates and times for deliveries and other shipments. This is not what I expected for a rules list, I thought to myself. Then, I noticed something taped to the bottom. One beep every three seconds, approaching. One beep every two seconds, nearby. A beep every second, on the island. That's more of what I expected to see. I accidentally said a little too loud. I paused. When I heard the sound of gunfire, I breathed a sigh of relief. I figured I should probably be on lookout, so I took to the top of the lighthouse. I still didn't quite believe everything he said. I mean, it's a government job, sure. There's also an underground prison. The light did seem to be emanating from some sphere, too. But it could just be that it used to be a secret prison that was turned into a lighthouse. Then, an experienced guy decided to play a prank on me and thought I was gullible enough to believe him. Plus, the light could just be some new technology I'd never heard of. But, at the same time, I was given a gun, and there was clearly a training area outside. Despite all these thoughts, I figured I might as well just wait and see. After about an hour passed, I heard footsteps coming up the stairs. Xavier, what in the hell are you doing up here? I heard Bill yell as his footsteps stopped. Well, I figured since you were training, I had to be up here. My anxiety spiked when I turned in the swivel chair and met his gaze. What did I say? It was more of a statement than a question. I don't trust your gut. Always ask me if you aren't completely certain of something. We don't watch during the day. We ready ourselves for the night. Got it? I shook my head standing up immediately. If anything shows up when it's lights out, the alarms will let us know. Now get your ass downstairs and get to working out those puny arms of yours. I rushed downstairs immediately, nearly falling over when I got to the last step. Then I booked it outside to the training area. I've never done well with confrontation, and him sounding like some kind of drill sergeant was all the confrontation I needed to get my ass into gear. I started with some stretches, as I had worked out in the past, back when I was considering joining the military, but I'd fallen soft since it was a few years back. Luckily, there seems to be most of the equipment I was used to, along with a few machines I'd never seen before. I worked out for hours until I noticed the sun beginning to set. That was when I heard something over the Bluetooth that I had forgotten about. Get ready for bed. I'm taking the first shift. I'll wake you up when you're next, or if I need some help. 
I guess he had forgotten about it when he was looking for me. It made me wonder how long it's been since he had someone around. But I didn't have time to stand around and think. Shower time was just before sleep, so I had to get going. As I walked into the bathroom, there was a set of stuff for me sitting on the sink. Toothbrush, body wash, shampoo, and the like. Afterwards, I went to bed and fell asleep in minutes. I don't think I had any dreams while I slept. All I remember is waking up to Bill's wrinkly face, shouting at me to, Get up, you piece of shit! He was always so aggressive, and I presume it was because of how long he's been doing this job. I'm up. Fuck. I was groggy, but I got in better sleep than I was used to. Why don't we have alarms or something? After a few seconds, I realized there was a slight buzzing sound in my right ear. You'll get used to the sound soon enough, kid. Now get your ass upstairs. That shout got me up. I definitely wasn't going to need anything energizing to keep me awake. Just the thought of him screaming gave me enough anxiety to keep me up for hours. He walked to his side of the room, and I rubbed my sore body while getting dressed. Shortly after, I stumbled upstairs. Sitting in the swivel chair, I realized I probably overdid it with the workout, and secretly hoped it would be a quiet night. There were a bunch of buttons and dials in the main viewing area, all clearly labeled with single words. There was also a binder I hadn't noticed my last couple times up there that I decided to flip through. It mostly explained what each label meant, even the obvious ones like off and on, though there were some that weren't so obvious, like the class dial, which showed the numbers 1 through 20 around it. Basically, it was a special dial for how strong the lighthouse's light was. The stronger the light, the more powerful of shades it attracted. It was only set to five, so I figured I should leave it as it is. If Bill left it at that level, there was definitely a reason for it. Even if I doubted it could actually attract the things that go bump in the night, I wasn't going to tempt fate any more than I had to. One of the buttons seemed self-explanatory, but the binder went way more in depth than I expected. Essentially, it was in case the lighthouse was being swarmed by shades. It had numbers of shades it must be used for for each class. Any more than 30, class 1s, 20, class 2s, 15, class 3s, so on and so forth. It was disconcerting to say the least that if there were less than 30 class 1s, we were expected to take them all down on our own. The terrifying part was that if there were more than one class 10 or higher, we were expected to use the emergency button. I had no clue why it would go up to 20 if that was the case, but I'm sure there had to be a reason for it. As I flipped through the binder, I started getting thirsty. I saw a cup sitting next to a button that said yellow, and figured Bill wouldn't mind me taking a bit of his water while he was asleep. So, while I was flipping through the binder, trying to find what yellow meant, I took a sip. The taste that hit my mouth was unlike anything I had tasted before like shit dipped in vomit, along with all the cleaning chemicals you'd find in the average home. I gagged immediately, and looked down to see an orangish-black substance. Holding back my vomit in realization of what I just sipped, I looked around for some water. Spitting relentlessly to get the taste out of my mouth, I noticed a sleek, metal water dispenser perched about ten feet away at the edge of the control panel. I fumbled to get a cup, then began hearing a beeping in my right ear. I counted how long it was between beeps, and thankfully, it was every few seconds. I grabbed some water and another cup, rinsing my mouth out and spitting into the empty cup. Then, I chugged the rest and threw both cups away before sitting down to look. At first, I didn't see anything. I turned to complete 360 in my chair multiple times, but still didn't see anything. The beeping sound started coming every two seconds, and I decided I should probably check the ground, so I got up, legs still sore, and looked around at the island below. What I saw looked like some kind of zombie crawling up the side of the island. I rushed downstairs to get a better look, pulling my gun from its holster. I ran outside to check it out, the beeping now just a constant beep rattling my one eardrum. I came to it and saw what it was. 
A jawless, rotting corpse, with the only thing covering it up being a few strands of seaweed. I took aim for center mass, hoping my years of gaming wouldn't fail me, and fired. The kick was more than I was expecting, and I realized then that I definitely pushed myself too hard while working out. The gun flew back into my nose, still in my hand. This pale motherfucker covered in sores had the audacity to start wheezing, laughing at me. With my probably broken nose, I took aim again and fired, holding the gun much tighter this time. It looked stunned as the bullet collided with its stomach. I reached for the neck snare, only to realize I had forgotten to grab it when I woke up. I ran into the lighthouse up to my bed, grabbing it, ran back downstairs to find... Nothing waiting for me. The beeping was still going at the same tempo, once every second like a metronome. I walked around trying to find it. Then I stopped when I heard the labored breathing along with the sound of footsteps. I crouched and walked around the lighthouse until I saw it. My heart was pounding. I felt it thumping from my toes to my head. I had to keep both hands on my gun to keep them somewhat steady. This is actually happening, I thought. No shits and giggles. This is an actual thing that's happening. I saw it as I rounded the turn and shot before it could see me. The thing looked stunned again, so I hurried to grab it by the neck. As I tightened the wire... It seemed to shoot electricity through it, nearly completely immobilizing the creature. Yeah, you're mine now, bitch, I said through my shaky voice. It only let out a pained groan in response. I dragged the thing down to prison, taking him to the third cell on my right. They had all been empty before, but there were already five other creatures down there. This zombie thing made six. And after locking it in a cell, I walked back up the stairs, and the beeping finally ceased. I made my way back up the lighthouse, slowly. My hands and legs were shaking so bad, I didn't think I could make it all the way up. But after a few stumbles, I did it. I sat down in the chair and had a miniature panic attack. I rolled over to the trash can by the water and threw up anything left in my stomach. That night, nothing else showed up. Which was good for me, because I didn't know if I could handle any more weird shit that night. When he woke up, Bill was only mildly pissed to find that I had used three rounds for a simple class two, but he was somewhat understanding at the same time. Apparently, he had lost a new guy on the first night a few months back to a class one. All in all, it was a pretty chaotic first night, but I had a feeling things were going to get a lot worse. Well, after my last post, I felt a little better, uh, psychologically speaking, of course. Uh, given my current situation, I can't exactly get to a uh, proper qualified psychiatrist. Uh, trauma is not, uh, surprisingly, something you just get over after some sleep. So I've come back to vent more of my traumatic experiences. It was my second night when those things decided to pick up. After my previous encounter, I figured things could only get worse. After seeing all things Bill had captured in just half of the night shift, I figured it was dumb luck I ran into a single shade. Oh, how right I was. After my shift from the first night, Bill helped patch my nose up, and it was, in fact, broken. Unfortunately, I was going to have to deal with it until the shipment the next day, since we were low on medical supplies. Just don't die tonight. It wouldn't be the shortest term, but I don't feel like having to train a new guy right after you. He said, in that gruff, yet somehow monotone voice of his. Like an old war vet who's seen some shit, it was unsettling to say the least. He must have noticed my grim expression because he followed up. Hey, listen, getting attached ain't gonna help either of us. For all either of us know, today's gonna be our last. Making emotional connections will only hurt one of us in the end. Try and keep that in mind. He wasn't the best motivational speaker, but he did seem to have his wisdom up his sleeve. This job matures the immature quickly, or it kills you. 
He hasn't died, but it seemed a part of him must have. Have you ever seen those cheerful old people? The ones who are constantly smiling, happy to be alive, offering you some candy for being such a kind young man? Bill definitely wasn't one of them. He was aged. It really showed in the stress wrinkles on his forehead. Residing beneath were glazed over eyes that likely had their own stories to tell. Complemented only by the perpetual bags hidden behind large, wire-framed glasses. His built frame looked out of place. Had he worked anywhere else, I guarantee he wouldn't put in the effort of working out every day. All in all, it was obvious he had seen some shit. You're right. I'm sorry, sir. I said, almost indistinctively. Knock that sir bullshit off. I ain't your drill sergeant. He responded in a stern, yet somehow emotionless, tone. Right, uh, sorry, sir, uh, I mean, um, Bill. I tried to sound more relaxed. He just shook his head in response. Overall, the day was pretty boring. I went easy on the workout, ate, shit, showered, all that fun stuff. When time came for my shift, I was awake before Bill could even come down. The beeping in my ear was all I needed. I counted the time between beeps. One second. It must have been an error, as I hadn't woken up to any of the beeps from the previous night. Regardless, I got dressed, grabbed the neck snare and my gun, and ran upstairs. Bill was nowhere in sight. I checked his bag, but still, no luck. I booked it downstairs and out the door to see Bill standing across from an amazingly beautiful woman. Immaculate, perfect, and other synonyms I can't think of right now. They appeared to be talking, almost whispering. I walked over to confront them. Then, the woman started shouting. Oh yes, another government dog. How fucking predictable. She was pissed, but her voice still matched her appearance to a T. How many times must I come here and kill your men before you understand what you're doing is wrong? Attracting entities to capture and torture them just for a bit of extra money? Do you have no morals? I decided to pull my Bluetooth out when Bill responded to her in kind. I do what I do, so others don't gotta, lady. It was the first time I had heard him sincerely pissed off, and it was terrifying. If I leave here, the government's just gonna keep on doing what it does. So long as I'm here, the burden will be placed on another soul. Why can't you get that through that thick skull of yours? After all these years, I've got my fair share of dues to pay. But that's thirty years of other people not having to. You're lucky I don't rat you out to the feds. You know better than me what that USPM group is capable of. They'd have your head on a silver platter if I warned them before you came. Now why don't you get your happy little ass off this island and leave us alone? I'll be back soon. We can talk about this again when the other dog is on his leash. She glanced at me, holding my gun up and aiming at her head. Calm down, kid. She ain't here to kill either of us. Not yet, anyway. Besides, that gun ain't gonna do much to her. I forgot the alarm spreads to everyone if a shade's been here for too long. Bill let out a sigh before continuing. They just put the gun down and let her go. She's an 18. Somehow I realized what he meant immediately. The dial goes up to 20, but it stays at 5. An 18 means we'd have to call in for help. I put my gun down, my entire body now shaking. I didn't say anything as the woman slowly approached the water, gracefully diving into the sea below. Who was that? I asked, with a slight tremble in my voice. Siren. She drops by from time to time to lecture me on how what I'm doing is wrong. She generally kills the new guy. Be glad your brain ain't liquid right about now. There was actually a hint of emotion in his voice that I couldn't quite place. Maybe fear or concern. It was hard to tell since his two defaults are monotone or pissed off and still somehow monotone. Does she have a name or anything like that? 
I was mostly asking in case she decided to kill me so I could shout an expletive at her before I died. Megami was all he responded with. You ought to get to bed. Still got a couple more hours before your shift starts. I'm not sure I can fall asleep right now. I think I'll just get a coffee and stay up with you instead. I can help out if something else shows up. He just grunted and headed back inside. I'd been told growing up that if I ever started drinking coffee, I should always drink it black. That I'd get used to the taste and save money on sugar and cream. So when I went into the kitchen to make some coffee and found no creamer, it wasn't the end of the world. As I waited for the water to heat up, I got to thinking more about that conversation between Bill and that Megami woman. What was the USPM? Why didn't she kill me? Does Bill put sugar in his coffee? That last one came up when I began to smell the fresh brew of coffee fill the air. It seemed like there was a whole lot more going on than I was led to believe through the interview process. But it makes sense. I work for the government now. I'm only told what I'm required to know. Bill is reasonable, though. He may be able to fill me in at least a little bit in a couple hours. The timer went off, interrupting my train of thought. I pulled out a couple mugs just in case I ended up having to double fist it. After pouring the coffee, I made my way upstairs, slowly to ensure I wouldn't spill any. How's the man of the hour doing? I asked sarcastically as my head peeked the stairway. Dead inside. He stated it in such a matter-of-fact tone that it actually made me a little uncomfortable. I let out a short, awkward laugh. Fair enough. Anything popped up yet? No. So far, nothing. Just a bunch of water. I realized as I approached the terminal-like area that Bill had put his Bluetooth back in, reminding me to do so as well. I put down the coffees, and just before I could get the earbud back in, Bill picked up a mug and started chugging it, still scalding hot. Um, you're welcome, I guess, I said hesitantly. We got the powdered stuff up here, you know. No need to go and make some downstairs. Just a waste of time, jackass. His perpetual frown softened a bit with that. So, Bill, my man... I paused, and he glanced at me, raising an eyebrow slightly. Uh, my dude. Uh, sorry, but I had to get that last one out. Uh, what's that USPM thing you mentioned earlier? That's USPM, he said, letting out a disappointed sigh. Government organization made to take down shades and the like. Apparently one of that one's friends or something was taken out by him, so whenever she shows up, I just bring them up and she gets antsy. Don't really know much about them, except for that one time when they sent one of them out here. They had to take over temporarily while I recovered from a disease one of those pieces of shit brought up from the bottom of the ocean. They only talked to me once when I asked them something trivial like their name, and they just told me it was classified. The best he just ignored their existence till that bitch comes back. That information, topped with the ever-present anxiety of knowing I very well may die the next time she came, led me to the decision to go through the binder again without saying anything. I flipped page after page to try and figure out what the yellow button meant. I know I'm hard on you, kid, he continued with a hint of sadness. I just don't want to see another kid die before me. It's the type of shit that sticks with you. All the ones I go easy on end up dying the fastest. Found that out the hard way about 25 years back or so. You can't afford to let your guard down, kid. I interrupted him. I know, I, I get it. I don't really feel like dying yet, so you can count on me outliving you. He let out a short chuckle before spitting into his cup. I went back to the binder but after flipping through every page and not finding one for the button, I figured I'd had to ask. So, what's the yellow button for? Bill looked at me out of the corner of his eye. Whenever the moon ain't right. I, what is that supposed to mean, exactly? I persisted. 
Blood moons, solar eclipses, full moons, all that stuff. Whenever the moon ain't right, we press that button. It, that seems pretty important, so why isn't it in the binder with all the other buttons and dials? He relaxed in his chair a little, letting out an old man moan before answering. I don't know. Guess they just expected at least one person working here to remember. I don't pretend to understand the government. Corruption, politics, power. I don't have any of that on my side, so I don't understand what they're thinking. My best guess is they figure I'll be around longer than I will. What makes you say that? Before he could respond, a beeping went off in my ear. After three beeps, it switched to every two seconds, and we were heading downstairs. Once we got downstairs, it was on the island. You go left, I'll go right. This thing's fast, so be careful, Bill said as he opened the door. I pulled my gun out and walked carefully while looking around. If something was here, I needed to see it before it saw me. The adrenaline was making my hands shake. I couldn't hold my gun steady. As I walked, I could hear multiple voices coming from my left. I turned and aimed, but nothing was there. The voices were now coming from behind me. I turned around, but as expected, nothing. Get over here, kid. I heard Bill yell as I looked around. On it! Be right there! I ran out of there full tilt thanks to my adrenaline anxiety. When I got to him, I assessed the situation. There were nearly a dozen tiny alien creature-looking things squealing and making all sorts of sounds. I was going to say something, but my body took over, and I aimed at one of them and fired. The bullet took an arm off before Bill shot two more of them. The remaining creatures charged us. I shot one in the head by accident before three latched onto my legs. At first, it seemed like that was all they were going to do, until my legs started heating up, like someone slowly putting a blowtorch up to them. Get off me, you sadistic fuckers! I screamed, trying to put my gun up to one of their heads. When I finally managed, I took the shot, kicking out the scent of gunpowder and burnt flesh. The other two started climbing up me, leaving melted fabric in their path. I heard a few more gunshots, and the one who'd made it to my chest by this point fell off and started writhing in pain. It was about this point I dropped my gun to try and pull the thing off, but as I went to touch it, Bill fired another round and took the thing's head off. The fact that he had shot two of those things off of me without grazing my skin definitely said a lot about his aim. With another four shots from Bill... They were all either dead or incapacitated. I had some pretty bad burns and was on the verge of collapsing when Bill spoke. What were you doing over here, kid? You could have died. He sounded surprised. What do you mean? I was already exhausted. You told me to come help. Shit. Well, I didn't. But that must mean we got at least a five on our hands. Then I heard Bill's voice behind me. Well, kid, you took a wrong turn and look where that got you. I heard presumably the real one let out a sigh. Oh, man. You had me worried for a second there. Thought you were one of them shape-shifting shades. I turned to the direction of the other voice to see a tall, lanky man in an old-fashioned suit and a top hat. He wore black aviators and steel-toed combat boots. Ow, oh, you've got to be fucking kidding me. What even are you? I asked, still out of breath. He responded in what I presume his normal voice was. It was similar to his fashion sense. The general idea of an old-timey English accent was there, but he would switch it up every so often. You need not concern yourself with that, child. For you see, I am... He was cut off by a bullet hitting him in the arm from Bill. Well, that sure hurts like a bitch. His words were faltering. I think I need to sit down. He projectile vomited before collapsing. Well, let's get these shades down to the prison before any more show up. We pulled all the live and dead alien-looking shades into one cell. But the strange voice guy we set up in a different cell, strapped to a chair with some special type of chains. 
The metal didn't look familiar, but it looked durable, unscathed, and didn't have any scratch marks on it. So either they were new, or they were just that strong. Whatever it was, we went back up to the surface and headed back to the lighthouse. Anyway, sorry for the short post. I've been having to really bust my balls lately. A lot's been happening, and I'm just trying to keep up. I'll update you guys when I get a chance. I won't be telling these old stories for much longer. Back for more, I see. It seems some of you have found an interest in my experiences and retelling from my last posts, so I'm back at it again. I'll be the first to say that lighthouse duty at a government-run location isn't exactly the best. It sounds cool, sure. I mean, I got to see things on the daily that most people wish they could see, just to make their lives a bit more interesting. But the only reason I worked there so long is the pay. I would love to go back to normal civilization and just relax without having to worry about dying every night, but I digress. So, without further ado, let's get back into this. By this point, I had only been working for about five, maybe six months. I know it's a big time skip, but not much happened in the middle. Not to mention some things have been happening at the lighthouse lately, so I'm trying to get you all up to speed. I was on a specialized workout routine that may have been in pretty much every shipment since my first week. The results were good, but I was still no bill. I wasn't waking up sore, which was ideal considering how my first night had gone. But, as usual as this day was, something seemed to be a little off since my night shift. Bill had been unusually coy. Hell, he didn't even yell at me when he woke up. But as the day progressed, he seemed to get more worried. Bill! I shouted over the sound of gunfire. Bill! I shouted once more. On my third day, he nearly shot me when I tapped him on the shoulder, so I decided yelling was a better option. I did one more set on the bench press before he was finished. Hey, uh, Bill! I only sort of shouted. What is it, kid? He responded, not quite as patronizing as I was expecting. What's going on with you? Everything all right? He let out a deep, somehow gravelly sigh. We gotta turn up the power tonight. We're both on guard duty. Higher-ups want some stronger shades, and these bones ain't what they used to be. I began to understand his nervous demeanor. He was legitimately worried about how the night was going to go. Are they sending us back up or anything? I waited for a response, but his unchanged facial expression answered regardless. Did they at least send some special equipment last shipment? I didn't actually get to see any shipments that came in at the time, since I was still just a liability. There are a few things we got, but it ain't gonna be of much use. We have a few syringes with a formula that temporarily increases the speed of our body's healing process. Extra rations, since the process burns through calories like a motherfucker. We also got some extra ammo, but that's about it, aside from the usual stuff. He glanced down at his pockets, and my eyes followed, an implicit question holding my eyes in place. He spoke up. There was something else, but it takes a few days before you'll be on your feet again, so you'll have to wait till tomorrow. It didn't come with this delivery. It was a special order I made while you were asleep last night, so don't bring it up to any suits. I gave him a nervous look, finally taking my eyes off his pocket. Uh, what do we have to turn it up to? Ten, he said, with absolutely no emotion in his voice. Last time, I barely made it out by the skin of my teeth. But I'm older now. You're going to have to stay on guard tonight. We won't be getting sleep, as you know, so drink as much coffee as you need to stay alert. I won't let you die. I'll have your back. Just make sure you've got yours, he said, before going back to training. I figured he'd let me know before we'd need to get ready, so I just went a little lighter with my weightlifting and made sure not to overdo it. By nightfall, we had already prepped practically everything. We ended up cutting training a few hours short just to make sure we'd have everything we need. Bill had a duffel bag full of different supplies, mostly medical. 
He even had a fanny pack for the syringes and some of the other more valuable medicines. We each had two spare magazines. Now, typically, we get one per shipment. If we run out of ammo, well, that sucks for us. So seeing the two extra worried me. So, I'm guessing something bad's gonna happen tonight if they gave us some more spare ammo. Bill sounded a bit anxious. We're expecting the same amount we do every night. The problem is, their strength. The shades coming for us are gonna be stronger than you think possible. They tend to kill any of the fuckers that are weaker than them. They're gonna be some intelligent creatures coming, and we need to outsmart them. Death is ever-present here. You know that. Tonight... Tonight's gonna change your whole view of what's dangerous. Just stay on guard. We'll need it if we want to survive the night. We sat for a half hour or so after Bill upped the strength of the lighthouse and waited. We didn't really talk, just sat looking for any sign of shades. But our earpieces didn't go off, and nothing was on the island. It's too quiet. Give me a sec, he said going to the wall to the right of the main control station. Opening what I assumed was a gun cabinet, he pulled out some type of binoculars that almost looked like the normal store-bought kind, but not quite. They had an impossibly blue tint to them, like it was the most perfect blue imaginable. I guessed they were some type of special night vision binoculars and waited for him to say something. About thirty minutes later, he finally finished rotating around the entire perimeter of the top floor. What in God's name's going on right now? They all throw a party or something? I added what little insight I had. Maybe it's linked to the full moon. He thought for a moment. Then my earpiece started going off. By now, the break in between beeps had become second nature to me. By that, I mean subconsciously, I was able to tell how far away they were. If it didn't go off again by second two, I knew that meant they were still a ways out. Same for if it didn't go off again by one. But by the time second four passed and there wasn't another beep, I realized something else had to be going on. The lighthouse wasn't attracting shades like normal, even cranked all the way up to ten. That was worrying. If Bill was telling the truth about the stronger shades killing off the weaker ones to get here, that meant something else had to be killing off the ones that were supposed to be showing up. You think it might be something stronger? I asked, a little fear evident in my voice. I think something else might be going on. I think there's a reason the government asked us to turn it on tonight. Let's wait it out. I'll keep checking around to see if anything pops up. Might be a sensor problem or something. He went back to scouting and I just tried to stay alert. A few more hours passed by before Bill suddenly jolted back while looking towards where I'm pretty sure the freeway is. I wouldn't be able to see the road even with regular binoculars thanks to all the trees and buildings, but Bill clearly saw something. What is it? Everything okay? I asked, a little panicked. He grumbled. I think I just figured out what the problem is. He gestured for me to come closer. Now, this gonna look a little weird, but just look over that direction with these binoculars over your eyes. He handed them to me. When I first looked through them, I saw a weak, light gray pulsing inside the building, like a light bulb in a black and white film. When I looked up at them, I could faintly make out trees, buildings, even an old lighthouse on shore that had been turned into a tourist spot. But the main thing that caught my eye was the different colors in the distance. One seemed to almost engulf the rest, its being a deep blood-red color. It was swirling, almost like it was creating a vacuum for the other colors around it. There was another that was almost, but not quite as large. It was light blue on the outer edges, but the rest was navy blue, getting darker the closer to the center it got. Both had to be at least as tall as the average redwood. The others around them varied in size. One was very short, but extremely wide, pitch black, except for the other colors around it. The thing I found interesting was that all the trees in the way seemed to give off a slight white haze. Those are shades. It's the energy they give off. It's more intense than anything I've ever seen. I'm guessing that's why nothing showed up. 
And they don't care about our little lighthouse, because there's an even larger beacon. It's either scared them all off or attracted them. Well, it's good for us regardless. Nothing we can do will wait it out. Unless the government decides to send someone in, we get to relax. I eased into my chair when he said, Stay alert, though. You never know what could... He was cut off by the alarm beeping. It was already one every second. The window in front of us shattered, and the beautiful woman we saw that night was standing on the windowsill. When I'm done, I'll be back for you. Lucky for you, I'm currently busy. She proceeded to jump backwards, singing a strange, familiar song. She glided perfectly into the water, despite the lighthouse being in the center of the island. She's just messing with you, right? I glanced at him. His face was stone, and he spoke. I hope so. Can't have kids like you dying every five minutes. But I guess if I die, I won't have to worry about that anymore. He let out a breath through his nose as he smiled. His yellowed teeth and receding gum line, paired with the emptiness in his eyes, told another story. He was hoping to die. He wanted to be put out of his misery, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. Why did you smile just now? There's no need for you to force something like that when you've never tried to comfort me before. I wasn't angry, just trying to figure out what made him change. It helps me feel human, kid. Day in and day out of watching the line between humanity and inhumanity. It grays the line between humans and non-humans. You know what it's like demonizing a group every day of your life. Truly hating the group simply because it was in order. Also, you can wake up every morning, tell yourself you want a complete piece of human shit. I call them shades because that's all I can call them without believing they're human. It's all I can do to keep my sanity together. I've thrown children in prison cells just because I was ordered to. Told they weren't human. If I can wake up and train to put human-looking things in jail cells, who's really the monster? Those things, shades, entities, whatever you want to call them, they're not all evil, kid. I've seen it with my own eyes. Someone who was a truly good person. She helped. So many people, cured so many people, and restored full forests. You want to know what ended up happening? The whole town came down to their door because she wasn't human? I guessed. Something like that. These people in mechanized suits came to her, offered her a choice. She could go with them, or she could fight them. Needless to say, she wasn't too keen on going with people threatening lives. She fought her heart out, but they burned her home down and captured her. This woman had saved thousands with miracle cures that scientists still can't understand. But people feared her. If they hadn't, those assholes wouldn't have even known she was there. Now tell me, which group is more humane? The one who stayed to fight for the people she had saved? Or the ones who turned their backs because it would inconvenience them? I didn't say anything for a few minutes. Is she still alive? Fuck if I know. But that entire town wouldn't remember a thing regardless. I'm probably the only one who remembers that day. Because I sure as fuck know whoever those guys were. They couldn't care less. I wasn't sure what to say. But after a few minutes, he spoke up. Look, kid. I'm not saying what we do is pure evil. But I need you to understand... It ain't all saintly work. We weren't destined on a holy mission from God. This is just the shit work some people gotta do. It's human nature to fear what we don't understand. But don't let that fear go away. Hold on to that feeling. Anytime you slip into a numbness, think about that thing in your life that brings you joy. Whatever it is. The moment you lose your fear, that's when you become jaded. Just like... He began a coughing fit. It was one of the worst I had heard. All the hacking, coughing, and choking, it reminded me of how my grandpa used to do the same thing. When he finished, he had red, teary eyes. Oh, fuck. I guess my lungs ain't as good as they used to be. Man, what I wouldn't do for a cigarette. He coughed again and continued. 
it just don't let yourself become numb to it, kid. That's when you lose yourself. Don't be like me. Don't die an old, emotionless man. He let out one final cough and gazed out the window, which I now realized was repaired. How? I started, but he cut me off. Some shades can break through bullet-resistant glass. So the top of this lighthouse was extended up, so pain replacement's pretty quick. The moment the console gives the command, the replacement drops down. He let out a sigh. Seriously, kid. I don't get how hardly anything phases you till there's a shade involved. I just shrugged and looked out to the shore. In all actuality, I had changed the subject intentionally. He always looked so serious, but that dead look in his eyes is terrifying. Maybe it's because I can't read him with no expression, but it's disconcerting to say the least. We sat there for who knows how long before Bill decided to try out the binoculars again. They're stopped, and not sure where. He paused. They vanished. What? Are they Batman? Hold on. There's a little sum in the distance. They look like humans based on their energy, but they're pretty far away. Humans? So, are you talking about heat? Is that what you mean by energy? I'm not really sure, but I doubt it. Typically, the stranger a shade is, the more light the binoculars pick up, but humans only give off a fraction of what you saw before. I can barely see them, so they must be on a plane or helicopter. How far out are they? He took a second before answering. Not entirely sure, but they're headed in a straight line towards whatever those shades went into. He looked down towards the ocean, and immediately I heard the first beep. I waited. After seconds two, I was already pulling out my pistol. It's coming for us. Get ready, Bill said putting down the binoculars and pulling out his own pistol. We immediately headed downstairs. I nearly tripped a few times since I hadn't stood much yet. We ran outside and the beeping was rapid. I had learned to tune it out for the most part while fighting, so I focused on the goal at hand. You see it? I asked, looking cautiously around. I think it might be waterbound, but if that's the case, the beeping shouldn't be so fast. He trailed off and began walking towards the side of the island facing the shore. Bill, what is it? You see something? I shouted to him. I followed where his head was turned and saw a woman I'd never seen before. She wore a gown that looked like it was made from spider silk. She had long blue hair that went down to her butt and her eyes that portrayed the emotion of severe loss. Like the person she treasured most in the world just died. When she turns to me, her expression softened, taking on the look of unbridled nervousness, with just a tinge of hope. Her face pretty much described how I was feeling at that moment. Then, I lifted my gun and shot her in her left arm. With her face now showing anger and hatred, that seems to snap Bill out of it as he raised his gun again and fired, shooting her in her right arm. He slung the neck snare around her and tightened it. He began heading to the cells without looking at me. By the time he came back up, he looked like his normal self, but there were some streaks of water on his face. Look, I know you don't like me asking you questions when you get like this, but is everything all right? I asked, knowing full well he was probably about to chew me out. I'm probably going to die before the end of the night anyway, so why the hell not? Let's just get upstairs first, then we can talk. When we got to the top of the lighthouse, we both sat down. Here's the deal, kid. When I die, you'll be the one taking over. Now I know you're going to ask how I know I'm going to die here. It's not for sure, but I'm the most experienced person the government's got for this stuff. So I'm either going to die here, 
or they're going to kill me. I know too much. I know you got a lot of questions, so here's what I'll do. I got a bunch of documents and files on my laptop. It could explain most of the questions you've got. When I die, be sure to check in the panel under the fridge. I'll place something there that'll help you out when I'm gone. How do you know I'm going to outlive you? I asked with growing anxiety. You know how many people have worked by my side over the years? No. Let me ask you another question. Do you know how many people one person can feel empathy for? No. I started getting a little worried about him. 150 people. That is the most amount of people, theoretically, anyway, that one person can legitimately care about. I stopped caring years ago. You want to know why that is? The only other person I know that lasted as long as you. I can't even remember their face. I've got hope you'll last at least as long as him. I was going to say something, but I couldn't think of anything. So I just sat in silence. I'm going to keep scouting. You might want to make yourself another cup of coffee. No other shades ended up showing up for the next few hours. And by the time Bill said something, I was half asleep. There's a new one with him. Um, sorry, what are you talking about? I just wanted to sleep so badly. The group of shades from before. They got a new one. The energy is weird. He handed me the binoculars. The energy was constantly morphing and looked almost distorted. Hold on, it looks kind of like one of those ones from earlier, I said, remembering there was a smaller version of it when I checked hours ago. Hold on, it's shrinking. It's going straight up. I think I see those guys you were talking about earlier going straight up, too. I think they're going east, but I can't really tell. Hand those to me, he said, pulling the binoculars out of my hands. Well, I'll be. They're either capturing or escorting. But based on how much energy he has now, I'd say it's the latter. He kept looking, and by the time he put the binoculars down... The sun had begun to rise. Hello everyone. Welcome back to my tales of torment from the known unknowns. I'm still trying to get you guys all caught up to pace with everything that was going on. I'm torn between happy and exasperated to inform you all that while everything has somewhat settled down, a lot of bullshit has happened. This will be my second-to-last tale from way back in the past, and unfortunately, it isn't going to be the most joyful. It started about a week after the events of the last post. The higher-ups hadn't sent us any more information on whether or not we would be amplifying the lighthouse again, which was music to my ears. Or rather, radio silence to my ears. Considering we hadn't captured pretty much anything the night Megami came. I was concerned they would ask us to turn it up for the next two days or something. Xavier, get your ass out here. I heard, right as I finished putting some turkey on my sandwich. Putting the rest of it together, I headed outside to see what Bill needed. Yeah, what's going on? I asked, biting into my turkey, white bread, and mayo creation. I've got to teach you something new. Legitimate hand-to-hand -hand combat. You gotta understand how to handle shit if you either run out of ammo or you lose your gun. There's only so much you can do on instinct, especially if a shade has training. You see, you got some muscle and a gun, but that's all you got. Finish what you're eating, then get your ass over here. He was standing in a small training field to the left of the lifting equipment, slowly putting on hand wraps. I took my time eating. I didn't feel like working, vomiting into my busy schedule of workouts. But eventually, the time came, and I made my way over. Alright, boy. You strike me as the type to learn from experience. So that's what we're gonna do. Bill said, tossing me a pair of hand wraps. 
Uh, okay then. So you're gonna beat the shit out of me until I figure it out. I joked. No. I'm gonna show you how each move is done. Then I want you to try it on me. If you get it right, then I'll beat the shit out of you. He retorted. That sounds counterintuitive. Just get over here, and let me show you how to put those on. After a few hours of Bill showing me how to fight, I was actually starting to get the hang of it. I don't know any of the moves' names, but he went through what works and why it does, essentially showing me how to counter and set up my own attacks. It was interesting to see him so serious about something like this, and I got the sense something else was up. On one of our breaks, I decided to bring it up. Is everything good? I've never seen you... I paused, trying to think of the right words. Well, like this. In case I end up dying, I want to make sure you can handle yourself. You and I both know the government ain't gonna stop running this place just because everyone here died. I'm trying to prevent as many deaths as possible. You seem to be one of the few people capable enough to run this place when I'm dead. I gotta make sure you're well off enough to carry on and train the future workers here. He responded, nonchalantly. Why do you constantly expect... Never mind, that's a dumb question. He opened up a little after some contemplation. Well, yeah, there's that, but there's also more. I know you're gonna ask what I meant, so I'm gonna tell you now. Leave it alone. He paused. Why don't you go make us some lunch? We'll take a break from training for the rest of the day. You might be sore. For sure. I'll get something started. I turned, feeling the ache in my abdomen as I headed for the lighthouse. Make up something big. I want to show you something. I think you'll be excited by it. He yelled to me as he headed towards a storage shed around the back of the lighthouse. You got it. I shouted back, closing the door behind me. I got some cans of chili and green beans, a loaf of I can't believe this is supposed to be bread, some butter, and garlic. Essentially, the bread is made to last for six months in dry storage. It's a precaution in case some world-ending catastrophe happens that prevents them from making shipments for a while. Unfortunately, this means the bread has almost no flavor and feels like cardboard. But if you make some garlic bread out of it, it's tolerable. Of course, we do get some regular bread too, but I used up the last of it with my sandwich before training. As I finished heating up the chili and green beans, I heard Bill come in through the door. I turned to my left, seeing he had a box under one arm and a small flat screen under the other. Um, you need some help? He headed towards the dining area without saying anything and began setting up everything that was in the box. There was a laptop, some cables, and a few movies. As he began setting up the TV, I pulled the garlic bread out of the oven and started prepping our food. Uh, hey, Bill. Everything okay? Yeah. Just bring over everything when it's ready. This is gonna be a one-time thing. Suits don't know I have this stuff here. He said, almost robotically. Bringing over bowls of food, I noticed him placing an obscure-looking movie into the disc tray. I don't remember the name of it, and for the life of me, I can't figure out where it went. But it was a high fantasy akin to Lord of the Rings. About half the movie passed before I said anything. You know, I never pegged you as the kind of guy to like fantasy. You got a soft spot for it or something? I heard a jostling coming from his pocket. Yeah, he grunted. I always liked the idea of being able to go on a miraculous adventure, saving people and bringing justice to evils of the world. He sighed. Just wish I could be doing that instead of this, you know? There was a hint of sorrow in his tone. Life there may be shit, but there's a whole lot less gray area than there is here. There was some more jostling before he pulled a small black canister out of his pocket. What's in there? This was that private shipment I was talking about last week. I think it's time you take it. He popped it open and dropped the contents into his hand. It was three tiny pill-shaped crystals. 
They were glowing a dim white. Looking at them gave me a feeling of familiarity. These will improve you. Make you stronger. It isn't by much, but they'll essentially increase your potential as a human. He asserted. It doesn't look like a shake weight to me. I retorted sarcastically. I'm being serious. Though, they'll put your ass on the ground for a few days. The first one will, at least. You'll need to take one of those any time you feel good enough to do so. He handed me one. Take it with some water. I'll leave the rest where you can find them. I'll be fine on my own for a few days, so don't you worry about me. Holding it, I felt some sort of rejuvenating energy coming from it. Like I was taking a bath at a hot spring. All right then. Here goes nothing. I popped it in my mouth and drank a glass of water. A few minutes later, I felt a mix of pleasure and pain coming from my stomach, before eventually fading to black. I awoke again almost immediately, finding myself in an unrecognizable place, yet it felt like I'd been there my whole life. It was a wide-open, circular room with winding corridors carved into every possible aspect of the wall around me. I began heading in a direction that felt right. When I got to one of the hallways, I hesitated before stepping into it. As I did, I was transported to a void. The only thing residing there was my voice. Who are you? Why have you come? What do you lack? What do you need? What do you desire? All of this played out at once by different renditions of my own voice. Are you being rhetorical by asking who I am? That sounds like a very me thing to do. I responded. The version of me that asked that question responded. Who are you, really? Beyond your selfish desires and labels, what makes you who you are? As understanding hit me, so too did a wave of depersonalization. That's a good question. Who am I, really? I'm just a guy, I suppose. Someone who's concerned about what will happen in the future. My voice responded. Who are you, Xavier? Why do you continue to do what you're terrified of? Isn't the money a good enough reason? Selfish, selfish, selfish. My voice chanted back at me, the meaning sending me into a daze. In all honesty, I know that if I leave, so many people are going to die. Of course, I can't leave if I want to out of fear of death, but beyond that, I don't want other people to die because I didn't feel like sticking around. I'm just someone who can't help but take on pain if it means other people don't have to suffer. And, my voice asked. And, in a weird way, I kind of enjoy it. Sure, every day brings a new possibility of death, but this is the first time in my life I feel like I'm making a difference. It's rejuvenating, I guess. I chuckled at the absurdity. The second me spoke up. Why are you here, then, if not for selfish purposes? My daze was beginning to lift. Well, this one is a bit more for my own benefit. I mean, getting stronger is nice, but at the same time, I need to be able to handle myself in case something happens to Bill. He's been weird lately, and I'm not sure if he's dying or something or what. If he ends up gone tomorrow, I won't be able to handle everything on my own. Tell me, what is it you're lacking? The third voice spoke. Talent, I stated. You're lying to yourself in so many more ways than usual right now. What are you lacking? My voice asked, rage creeping into his voice. I thought for a moment. A skill that will allow me to hold my own. If that is so, what skill do you need to handle yourself? The fourth voice questions. Something to help me when I have no other options. Something that I can be proud of. 
something that will allow me to stand up for myself no matter the situation, I replied, confidence beginning to build up in me. Then tell me, what is your desire to achieve your goals? The final voice inquired. Strength, I answered without hesitation. Then a new voice came from the void. My exact voice. What does strength mean to us? I thought for hours, debating what strength looked like to me. A stray moment made its way through my mind. A far-off residual presence I'd long forgotten. It was a memory of my dad before I was old enough to talk. He was reading to me from a large book, that one far too complicated for a kid to understand. It was about a man who was constantly knocked down and treated like shit. But no matter what he went through, he persisted. Determination never allows him to falter, no matter what. As this memory bounced through my mind, I spoke unconsciously. Willpower. Saying this launched me back to reality, and I found myself in one of the cells we held shades, gasping for air and sore all over. I looked across from me, one of the shades we'd captured staring at me with a grin from another cell. You look pretty rough, buddy. How's it feel to be on that side of the bars? His gurgling voice was unsettling. What happened? I questioned. Not sure. Your co-worker kind of dropped you in there a few days ago. A realization dawned on me as he finished. If that was the case, that meant shade collection would be happening at some point today. I couldn't stay locked up. Who knew what they'd do to me? I ran to the bars, trying to reach the thumb pad print, but it was out of reach. After a few more minutes of trying to reach it, I gave up. Sitting in the middle of the cell to think. Was there really any way out if I couldn't touch the thumb pad? If there was, a shade probably would have escaped by now. We have captured some intelligent ones, but still. You try to pop a blood vessel over there? The creature across from me inquired with a sinister snicker. Just shut it. I don't plan on getting taken away with all of you. Even if I do work here, if I'm locked up, they might assume I turn into a vampire or something. He began cackling. Oh no. If you were vampirized, you would have combusted by now. They know that. Trust me, the government has their nose in us for a reason. I paused. What do you mean, combust? Grating could be heard from the left side of the hall. Sunlight followed soon after, along with two sets of feet. You can ask your co-worker when he gets here. I'm sure he knows more than me. He let out a chuckle before heading to the back wall. I heard a woman's voice first. It was familiar. I can't believe you treat them like this. Your government knows no bounds. Next was Bill's voice. I agree. But no matter what you do, more kids are just gonna die. You understand that, right? I know you're not stupid. You seem to forget. I don't care about human lives. There's plenty of you out there. Spiritual being like myself, on the other hand, we're shorter in number. If you break us down by species and race, you can see the massive difference. I'd much rather the government do experiments on human children. You understand, right? The woman finished, reaching my cell shortly after. Yeah, here he is. Had to lock him up. Lighthouse caused some kind of mutation or something in him. Woke up one morning and he was levitating in bed. I didn't really have a choice. The woman turns to me, and I realized who it was. Megami? Bill, what are you doing here with her? Listen, kid. He turns to me, his somber gaze piercing me. I can't keep watching over the lighthouse anymore. Neither can you. They're going to take you away. No matter what happens here, neither of us are going to see the light of day again. His eyes began to water, but he blinked the tears back. All right. 
Now I know he's here. I have no reason to keep you alive. I'll be sure and keep the future employees plenty of company. Megami used her hand, stabbing Bill in the gut. He toppled to the floor, blood spewing from his stomach. A minute or so passed before Megami turns to leave. You know, this ain't as bad as I thought. Bill wheezed out, turning his attention to the ceiling and smiling. He coughed a few times. I always figured it'd hurt more. I mean, sure. He coughed a few more times. This hurts like a motherfucker and all, but overall, not so bad. As she began walking, Bill started wheezing again. Down some ale and chill your breath. Or she's a common. He coughed again. Upon ye night. Megami paused. Do you really want to mock me right now? I could make your death far more painful. Bill chuckled with a hack. Just reminded me of my sailing days. Yeah. He coughed a few more times. You remember that one, don't you? They wrote it because of you. She sneered, heading back to where she'd come from. I'd been sitting in the middle of my cell in shock. Bill, what's going on? How do I save you? I, I mean, there's got to be a way. You had a plan, didn't you? Hysterical laughter permeated the air. It was the shade in the cell across from me. You dumbass. That was the plan. Uh, no, Bill's, Bill's a smart guy. He wouldn't have done all of this to die. Streaks of water began flowing down my face. So, what's the plan? I cried out. Kid. Bill chuckled, clearing his throat as best he could. Remember what I said about getting attached? This is one of those moments... You gotta stay strong, because if you don't, more people are just gonna die. You're up to bat now. Make it worth the run. He hacked some more, laying still after. What do you expect me to do? I, I just got here compared to you. I white-knuckled the bars of my cell as I cried. Do you really think I could trade some newbie? You're really a stick in the mud, kid. I haven't taught you anything new in a month. He coughed. Aside from the combat training, of course. Haven't you realized? When was the last time I got on your ass about something? As his voice raised, he fell into another fit. Fuck. Hey, you can do it. Have faith in yourself. Just then, something came over me. A sudden moment of realization. I looked to him, wiping tears from my eyes. Wait, you really mean that? You really have grown. You should be proud of yourself. Not many people fight as long as you. He trailed off. I, I think it's high time. I leave you to it. Tears continued streaming down my face. I won't let you down. Escaped my mouth. My muscles couldn't keep me up as I collapsed to the ground, crying relentlessly. I woke up some hours later to a man shouting. Looks like Bill didn't make it after all. I sat up, rubbed my eyes, trying to remember where I was. As my eyes adjusted, I saw a man in a black combat suit staring into my soul. When my brain caught up to the situation, I stumbled out what I could. Uh, Megami killed Bill after he locked me in here. I, I, I couldn't. The man wouldn't let me finish. Xavier, right? I mean, yeah, I, I guess. He cut me off again. We know what happened. He tried to get back up, but we didn't have the resources. Lots of shit been going on lately. Let me get you out of there. 
You're one lucky son of a bitch. Bill knew what he was doing. He touched the thumb pad, unlocking the cell door. A voice called out from behind him. Oh, come on. You're letting my cellmate go. I thought we were really starting to get along. The man's face reformed to fit his new emotions. I don't want to hear any one of you shade fuckers talking, or I swear to fucking God I will kill you on the spot. The echo from the metal room we were in resounded for a good thirty seconds. I guess I'll be on my way, I said, taking a glance down at Bill's pale body. Yes, you will. Night falls in a few hours. You'll be keeping watch by yourself until we get a new hire. Until then, keep doing your job. He mumbled something under his breath before shouting down the other end of the hallway. All right, get your ass over here with that body bag. Bring a couple of others too. We've got some talkers. My way to the lighthouse was a blur. I barely remember closing up the ground panel to the cells. Inside, I headed to the cabinets and pulled out the last can of chili. The next thing I remember was pouring it into a bowl to microwave it, which is when I found the note. It was from Bill, taped to the bottom of the can. Get my laptop from the shack. It's a panel under the carpet. Code is... Say what you will. I'm not giving you guys any of his codes. Laptop code is... I pulled the note off, put the can down, and glanced out the kitchen window. Crazy motherfucker. Running out to the shack, I swung open the door. I grabbed the crowbar I'd seen leaning against the wall a few times and pushed the carpet aside, seeing a couple planks that made up the floor were more worn than others. Prying them up took a few minutes, but once I got them, the floor safe was all too obvious. Putting in the code, I opened it to see a hiker's bag, a laptop, and some cables. I pulled it all out just in case then put the floor back in order before heading back to the lighthouse. Setting everything down at the dining room table, I noticed my earpiece laying at the far end. I put it in before setting up the laptop and typing in the code. There was only one file on the desktop labeled Ford Xavier. I hesitated momentarily before deciding it would be best to look into it now. Opening the file revealed a list of documents and other files. I opened the document labeled Read Me before anything else. Hey kid, guess the time finally came. I've been planning this since you finished your first month here. Initially I kind of figured you'd croak pretty early on. Guess that's calling the kettle black now, though. Whatever, I'm sure you don't want me reminding you of that. Despite me telling you to not care about me, I know you did. That's not something you just stop doing. It's something you learn with time, I guess. At least, that's how it went for me. I'm not sure how long it's been since I've died, but I'm hoping it's pretty soon after everything happened. I don't want you to find this months after you've gotten over my death, because something like that can break a man. Anyway, in case I couldn't say anything to you for whatever reason, I want you to know I got faith in you. You're just a kid, and you still got so much room to grow. Look at where you are now. And no, you still got a whole hell of a lot more potential. I know, I know, you're just some kid from the coast without a family, but that's not who you are. Sure, those are features of you, but there's so much more to you. Hell, there's more to everyone than that. Most people can't handle a job like this, just like how most people are professional painters or doctors. There's something for everyone. And with each new field, people can hone their skills, the more opportunity everyone has to shine. Now, look at where you are. 95% of people who work at the lighthouse die in their first two weeks. You're in that 5%, kid. Don't you get it? I know this may not have been the route you saw yourself taking when you graduated high school, but you're good at it. Have confidence in that. Anyway... I felt you needed to hear that from someone you respected. Keep your head held high. You're remarkable, kid. I smiled shakily, tears forming in my eyes. Damn it, Bill. I chuckled awkwardly, sniffling to combat the snot making its way out of my nose. I rubbed my eyes, clicking off the document shortly after. 
Glancing over the folder again, I saw a page labeled The Pill and clicked on it. Hey kid, glad to see you're still alive. I'm not sure if I got you one of those crystal pills yet. Regardless, I'll be leaving them in the bag before I die. They ain't steroids or anything like that. They're literally crystals infused with a neutral soul. You might notice they feel familiar. That's cause that's what the lighthouse uses to attract souls. I don't know all the mumbo jumbo behind them, but essentially, taking one will strengthen your soul, in turn, strengthening your body. The first few will put you out of commission for days at a time, so you can only use them if you know you'll have enough time to recuperate. Despite how it sounds, though, it doesn't improve you much. Those pills in the container hold fractions of a soul meant to slowly increase your potential over time. If you need to get more in the future or anything else, check out the uh, Fetch Quest folder. It's got a bunch of information along with everything you'll need to get stuff to the lighthouse safely. They can get you literally anything you might need. Anyway, good luck, kid. I've got faith in you. Instead of feeling sad, I felt confused. The document had left me with so many questions with no one to ask. The growling of my stomach brought me back to the present, reminding me I hadn't eaten anything in several days. Putting the bowl of chili in the microwave, I wondered why I wasn't dying of thirst. I mean, sure, I was thirsty, but it was akin to waking up at 3 a.m. heading to the bathroom sink to chug water from the faucet thirsty. I grabbed a glass from the cupboard above the sink and began pouring myself water, my mind losing itself to the day's events yet again. What was I really going to do? Could I keep this place running without Bill? That thought brought a burning sensation back in my eyes. He had faith in me, but... But what? He wasn't the kind of person to lie to make you feel better. He was a hard-ass, blunt, and needlessly aggressive. He'd only ever compliment me a handful of times, half of which were sarcastic retorts. But what if... My thoughts were interrupted by a cold sensation running its way over my fingers. I looked down, remembering what I was doing. I shut off the water, grabbing a paper towel to dry off my hand and cup. What if he just wanted me to have faith and... The sudden beeping of the microwave nearly caused me to chunk my glass of water, half of it spilling to the floor. How oh, fucking hell... I sat down and grabbed my glass bowl from the microwave. Putting the bowl on the counter, I forced myself back into autopilot. What if all he wanted was for me to have faith in myself so I'd be less likely to fuck up? Does that even make sense? Maybe the best course of action is to just listen to him. No, there's no maybe about it. If Bill had faith in me, I'll have faith in myself. Turning back into my surroundings, I realized I'd poured myself more water on top of cleaning up the mess I'd made. Weird, I breathed, wondering how I hadn't realized. I looked out the window in deep concentration. Sipping from my water, I noticed the sun was already setting. I sure as hell hope I'm ready, I muttered out, putting the glass of water down. This will be your last replacement. Her name is Griselda. The suit stated, mumbling something under his breath. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, Griselda, the woman finished for me, shaking my hand. Uh, right, uh, I'll try to remember that. Uh, not too great with names. Returning my hand to my side, I turned to the suit. All right, kick rocks. I can handle it from here. Glaring at me, he said, You mind your tone next time. Before turning to the door, letting it creak shut behind him. I'm sure he already filled you in on the basics. My tone was neutral, as it had been for the past month. She let out a slight chuckle. Yeah, I'll be seeing unusual things here and all that. Her smile stood out like a lighthouse in the fog. My face went stern. You need to understand, this isn't some prank on the new kid or anything. You will see terrifying shades while you're out here. I need to know that you understand what's at stake here if you slack on your duties. 
Death is all too present in this job. There's been five before you since... I paused, recalling Bill's agonizing death. Well, since the previous long-time worker here passed. You're really trying to sell this bit, aren't you? Seriously, I'm not going to fall for it. Can we just get started on the training? Her white teeth told me she wasn't buying it. I raised my voice. Listen here. I relaxed a bit before continuing. I am telling you, this isn't a normal lighthouse job. Average pay for one is just over one grand a month for new hires. $100,000 salary starting pay isn't anything a lighthouse attendant would ever make. She'd gone pale. Um. Her brain suddenly overclocked, showing on her face as she attempted to process what I told her. You're sure this isn't a prank on the new gal? Are you sure you read the documents before signing your life away? I sighed, rubbing my strained eyes. Yes, of course I did, but I just figured it was like the government was trying to see if Nessie was real or something. There were occasional tremors in her words. I wouldn't know if it is, but there's a whole lot of other shit that is. I paused. Alright, follow me. This part of the tour was generally reserved for last, but I wanted to ensure she understood. As we reached the faux patch of grass, I pulled the lever. You first, I stated, gesturing for her to head down to the now revealed steps. Her right foot hit the first step when there was a squeal from the cell block. Hey, Warden, you bringing us food already? We're starving down here. His voice was etched with sarcasm. Hey, shut the fuck up down there before I decide to shoot you in the head, too. It was then that I noticed Griselda had paused. Well, you're good. That guy's locked up. Don't worry. It took a minute after I finished for her to build up the courage to continue. The overhead lights buzzed to life as our feet made contact with the below-ground floor. There were shades lining the cells, most sitting or sleeping. But I saw the one who'd been shouting. Its hands were slightly dangling out of the bars. Hey, Warden. Is that our snack? I walked over to the shade cell, pulled out my gun, and fired. It fell back with a barely noticeable thud. Griselda screamed over the ringing in the tunnel, covering her ears. Why the hell would you do that? He was a prisoner. I looked at her. Baffled initially, until I remembered she'd only been on the island for 15 minutes or so. Training rounds, don't worry. He isn't dead, the government wouldn't approve of me killing one locked up. I responded, loud enough for her to hear me over the ringing in her ears. The shade got back up, waving one grey, rotting hand towards her. I think I scored some points with her. You think I got a chance? I held the gun back to his head, then heard a voice somewhere behind me. Just kill him already. Then another joined in. Please, he's been a pain in the ass. A third joined the chorus. Seriously, I'm tired of his shit. I'll kill every last one of you if you don't shut the fuck up, you pieces of shit. That seemed to shut them up. Alright, Rosaldo, come look at this guy. She just stood there, mouth agape, hands still over her ears. I turned fully towards her, gesturing widely for her to come over to me. She took a shaky step before turning and booking it up the staircase. I chased after her, catching up right as she got to the top of the stairs, tackling her as gently as I could. Her face radiated surprise, pain, and anger like a three-for-one combo. Listen to me, I screamed trying to get her to understand. You signed up for this, got it? There's no backing out as much as you may want to. As she shuffled under me, it began to click how insane I must have looked. When I got off of her, she stood up immediately, and I thought she was going to sprint again. Look, I'm sorry for tackling you like that. It was uncalled for. Uncalled for? No shit, it was uncalled for. She took a deep breath, all the way down to her diaphragm. Her voice quieted somewhat, but she was still yelling. 
I don't know what kind of scam this is, but I want out. If this is some sort of game show, it isn't funny. I don't care what you're trying to pull here, but I don't want any part of it. Alright, I get why you don't trust me. But you gotta understand, I've been running this lighthouse practically by myself for the past couple of months. I saw you sprinting, and I went into fight or flight. At this job, the people who run are generally the shades. I finished under my breath, not to mention the Adderall. What the hell are shades? She was back to distrustful screaming. Head down there and you'll understand. Look at what's in the cells. You'll understand, Griselda. Griselda! She huffed. And I'm not going down there while you're still up here. You might just be trying to lock me down there. All right, I understand. I'll go first, then you can follow behind. It'll make sense. Trust me. She scoffed for people on the shore to hear. Yeah, trust you. Okay. She hesitantly followed behind me as I headed back down the stairs. When we made it back down, we headed down a few cell lengths so I could find one shade that couldn't be mistaken for a human. This is one of our inmates. She hesitantly took an eye off me to glance at the creature standing inside. What the... what the hell? She stammered out, stumbling back. What the hell is that thing? That, my dear Grizz, is a shade, I stated, looking over the foul, raven-like creature within. It reeked of rot, some flesh dangled from its beak with molted feathers lying beneath the four-foot beast. Opening its mouth, it let out an ear-piercing squawk, causing Roselda to cover her ears, shuddering. After a few minutes, she put her hands down hesitantly. Is that real? As real as the shapeshifter behind us, I stated, matter-of-factly. She slowly turns to see an empty cage. Quivering, she spoke. I think... I think it got out... I spun around. Holy shit, we need to put this whole place on lockdown right now. I turned to bolt up the stairs, then turned back to Griselda. <laughs> uh, did I get you? Her face was pale, and it looked like she was about to start crying. You're a dick, she yelled, running up the stairs. I followed up after her shortly after, worried she might lock me down there. A few minutes passed of her adrenaline slowing before I spoke. Alright, I'm sorry for scaring you, but you'll need to get used to that terror response. If you'll be working here, you need to fight. Otherwise, we'll both be dead by morning. We take shifts once you get your bearings. But until then, you'll need to get used to the night shift and your fear. The longer that takes, the longer we'll be working together, which puts more strain on our bodies. She shook her head. I really don't want to do this anymore. You'll have a month before you can decide whether or not you want to stay here. I shrugged, mumbling. Assuming you make it that long. But... Look, you signed the paperwork, didn't you? Griselda nodded. Then you should know you're already on the roller coaster. So either you can swim to shore now and hope the government doesn't come after you, or you can stick with it long enough to make it home safely. There aren't any other options here. Trust me. When she didn't say anything, I continued. Alright then. Let me finish showing you the ropes and we can get started on some basic training. You like coffee? I asked as we made our way to the final part of the tour. No, I'm more of a tea kind of girl. She said, still a little pale despite an hour passing. Well, coffee is your new best friend. We don't get anything else with caffeine in it, and you'll need it to prevent you from passing out after the adrenaline rebounds. I asserted, proud of myself for how well I'd handled everything since the cell block incident. Rebounds or rebound? I know what I said. We generally come pretty close to filling that block of cells by the end of each week. I stated. There has to be at least 50 rooms in there. There's no way... Her face went even paler. Cells, 
and 70 to be specific. You'll generally be dealing with four per shift, on average, anyway. Sometimes we'll get spikes of activity, though. It only started happening about a month back or so. We get shipments of tranquilizers now, so if we run out of space, just hit one of the shades in the cells with a shot of it and wait one minute. Then throw the new one in. They're expensive as hell, so don't waste them trying to catch shades. Something about their genes make them less susceptible to tranquilizers, so they had to come up with some new way to put them to sleep. I looked at her to see if she had any questions, but she said nothing. There's a side panel at the bottom of the cell block stairs that go to the tranquilizer. You'll just need to scan your thumb and it'll open up. It looks like a gun. Should have 12 rounds in it still. There's a small box of ammo up here that we can use to restock the gun every morning if we've used it. A double check in the gun is something we do every morning to ensure it's always fully loaded. So, um, we won't need it very often, will we? Griselda asked hesitantly. It doesn't happen too often, but we'll need it sometimes. Mostly just a precaution until they install the second layer to the prison. She shook her head, like she was etch-a-sketching a thought out of her mind. Okay, so you said there was some training we needed to do. Yeah, just a minute. I need to show you around the panel. Then we'll get to it. I stated, heading upstairs to the control panel of the lighthouse. As we finished our meal, I began heading to the staircase. Alright, night's coming. Time to head up. Be sure and grab a mug. Y you don't have one? Griselle stammered out, heading to the cabinets. She opened multiple before finding the right one, pulling a mug down. I leave mine in there. Only wash it every few days. I only realized how gross that sounded after verbalizing it. That's pretty unsanitary, she replied, heading over to me. Yeah, I guess it is. I gave her a once-over. You don't have your neck snare. Glancing down, she became flustered. I, I took it off while we were training. Well, don't worry. The lighthouse isn't on, so nothing's showing up yet. Go grab it and meet me up top. I began heading up the stairs when I remembered something. And don't forget your earpiece. I hoped she heard me through the still closing door and headed to the top floor. Getting to the top, I had prepared a few things before turning the lighthouse on. Since Bill had been the one to get everything ready before, I never knew there was actual prep work. All I knew was that I had to flip some switches and press a button as my shift ended. But now, thanks to the binder from all that time ago, I figured out what everything was there for. Three switches on the far left console flipped to the left up. This started up the generator for the power used by the lighthouse. Middle switch down. This removed the casing that went over the light. Right switch up. This acted like adding the fuse, preventing the lighthouse from going over level 10. If we didn't flip it on, the lighthouse could go as high as it wanted if we fucked up. As the power began flowing, I double-checked, ensuring the lighthouse hadn't turned on yet. Seeing it hadn't, I got ready to press the green button next to the switches. The moment I heard Griselda's feet on the metal stairway, I pressed it, lighting the whole top floor. By the time she reached the top, I was already sitting, looking out at the shore that seemed to grow further with each day. There's something about work in here, you know. Griselda sat next to me in the other swivel chair. What do you mean? It's just that you look out across the ocean and land, but then the realization hits you. You're looking at the same stuff as everyone else, but their lives are peaceful. We're only a mile from shore, and yet... I took a breath before continuing. And yet, we're experiencing a completely different reality from all of them. A life full of paranormal shit that even religious people discredit as being nothing but fiction. Even the so-called open-minded people are ignorant to all of this. Yeah, I guess. But, I mean, isn't that good? I mean, I don't think most people would be as relaxed as you with everything. You don't get it. I've been working here for months. Anyone can become desensitized to something with enough exposure. 
If I was still scared of everything after all this time, I'd be dead. That's what I'm here for, to show you the ropes until you're not pissing yourself at any sign of trouble. You'll get used to it, or die. That's just how things work around here. I glanced at her to see if she responded. When she didn't, I continued. For the record, I don't plan on letting you die. I'll do everything in my power to make sure you don't. But if you can't pull your own weight, then my resolve isn't going to be enough. It's the law of the jungle out here. And I mean, hell, if you do make it long enough to quit, you won't have to worry about guys harassing you. You'll have the aura of a war veteran with a no-fucks-given attitude. I chuckled, trying to see if that lightened the mood at all. There was a tremble in her voice. Looking over, I saw tears streaming down her face. Why can't you sound the least bit empathetic when talking about me dying? This is so fucking terrifying, and I feel like you don't really get it. This is my life you're talking about. It's like you're expecting me to die, but trying to hide it. I frowned, trying to think of the right thing to say. My head was still in a daze from the constant sleep deprivation. There was a long period of silence before I came up with something. This is a brutally dangerous job. I don't want you to die, if that's what you mean, but I've already had to watch the person who trains me die. He bled out, slowly and was talking to me until he passed. You aren't the first after him, not even the second. Each person I've trained up until you, I've watched die slowly and painfully. I'm not adequately prepared to properly train you, nor the people who have come before. A tear made its way down my face. I'm really hoping I can do for you what Bill did for me, but I'm terrified that I can't. Griselda turns to me, tears continuing to flow. I... She took a few deep breaths. I'll do what I can. Some time passed in silence before I heard a beep in my ear. Shit. Get ready, I told her, standing up and reaching for my neck snare. Oh, uh, um, okay. She pulled her gun from its holster. You'll just be watching for now. Only use that if things get hairy, but I mostly just want you to watch for now. As the beeping sounded to every two seconds, I booked it down the stairs. As I slammed into the door, the beeping shortens to every second. They're on the island now. Keep an eye out. All right. She responded hesitantly. Glancing around showed no sign of any shades. You see anything? But she couldn't even get a response before something collided with my head. As my body slammed to the ground, all air exited my body. I was trying to gasp for air, but my lungs felt compressed. A shot rang out, and a weight on my back kicked me further into the ground. I was finally able to breathe again. There was a scream and two more gunshots before I managed to stand up. Pulling out my pistol, I looked to Griselda, who was pinned under. Magami. You bitch. I pulled the gun from my holster, shooting three bullets into her back. She turns to me, hatred permeating her bloodlust. In an instant, she was face to face with me. Magami attempted to grab my throat, but I narrowly dodged, tackling her to the ground, barrel in her gut. I don't think you realize what these bullets are. Do you feel it yet? Leeching away at the fibers of your existence? Three of these are a lot to take for one shade. Before I could continue, she flipped me onto my back, inverting our position. I know a good doctor. I'm sure he'll be able to save me. You, on the other hand, won't have such a luxury. She reeled back to punch me in the gut when a gunshot rang out. Blood splatted my face, and I heard a scream. The weight of Megami's body falling over me was more than I would have expected. Making my way out from under her, I wiped my face with my shirt. As I stood up, I looked down at her, kicking her a few times to see if she was still alive. When there was no movement, I tapped a button on my earpiece. Megami's KIA. She won't be a problem anymore. 
then pressed the button again. Glancing around, Griselda was nowhere in sight. I headed into the lighthouse to find her curled up on one of the chairs in the dining area. Hey, I need some help bringing her down to the cells. She didn't respond. All right, I'm sure I can drag her down there no problem. You just recuperate for a bit. I sighed, making my way back out to Megami's body. Picking up one of her arms, I began dragging her body to the underground cell block. As I made my way down the stairs, I could hear shades mocking me. But as I passed each of their cells, they went silent. By the time I made it to an empty cell, all I could hear were my footsteps and the dragging of Magami's corpse. Leaving her in the cell, I shouted, Let this be a lesson to all of you. Humans are more capable than you think. We may be weak, but we're innovative. I could kill each of you right here and now, but I'm not going to. Stay silent if you know what's good for you. Then, I made my way back to the surface. But right as I closed the cell block, another beeping went off in my ear. It was already at one per second. Griselda, where are you? I got no response. Looking around, I saw the source of the beeping. Something that shouldn't have shown up. Something we had safety measures in place for in case they came around. A spirit. This one was clearly visible, and even looked like a normal person. But the energy flowing off them like tidal waves told me it wasn't weak. Griselda, wherever you are right now, hide in the top of the lighthouse and press the yellow button. This attracted the attention of the water spirit standing in the center of the island. The situation wasn't ideal, but I still had three rounds left in my gun. I can't believe this shit, I whispered under my breath. The water spirit seems to only be passing by until I screamed. Its head turns to me. The gaze then met my eyes with mania. Maybe it was an immature one, but based on its appearance, it seems to be older than the oceans themselves. The shade gestured for me to come to it. I raised my gun and fired, but the thing narrowly dodged the bullet. I took aim with both hands and took another shot. Again, it narrowly dodged. Man, I hope she hurt me. I thought to myself as I readied the next snare in my left hand, gun in my right. Suddenly, the shade was gone. I tucked and rolled, turning to find it behind me. I fired my final shot. As it dodged my final bullet, I holstered my gun and white-knuckled the neck snare in both hands. The spirit gazed longingly at me before raising its hand. Griselda, yellow button in the middle of the console! I was interrupted by a burst of energy slamming me in the chest, the wind in my lungs being forcefully excreted from my nose and mouth simultaneously. I lost grip of the neck snare as my back thudded to the ground, kicking out the last few molecules of air I had left. I gasped for air, vision beginning to fade, when a blazing flash of light kicked on overhead. The seizure-inducing flickering caused me to slam my eyes shut as I tried to grasp the straws of consciousness tethering me to the moment. When my breathing began to feel second nature again, I fell into a coughing fit, spitting out the mucus that coated my lungs. As the flashing subsided, I opened my eyes and stood. Looking around, I found the button had worked. I stumbled my way to the lighthouse entrance. Heading up the stairs, I found Griselda in the fetal position on one of the chairs. I'm proud of you, I stated, sitting down in the chair next to her. Thanks, she muttered out, maintaining her position. If you want to go to bed, you can. Nothing else should be showing up the rest of the night. No, I'm fine. Besides, if I do, then you'll be alone up here. She extended her legs to touch the ground, still holding herself. If you're sure, I'm going to go take a shower then. If you get a beeping, just use the yellow button again. We're allowed to use it more on first nights, so we won't get in trouble. I started heading to the stairway. Wait, what do you mean, beeping? She looks confused as she turns to face me. Shit, you never got an earpiece. Uh, you know, the cabinet we keep all our stuff in at the entrance? 
It's in a small charging compartment on the left wall of it. Always put it in before we turn on the lighthouse, I instructed, before heading down to get showered off. As I made my way back to the top of the lighthouse, I found Griselda, blanket over her, steaming cup of coffee in hand. She was looking out over the ocean in contemplation. I walked over to her and sat down. Beautiful, isn't it? She jumped a little when she heard me, nearly spilling some of the coffee. Um, yeah, it's just strange and terrifying. Trust me, you'll get used to everything soon enough. You've already proven your mettle. That woman you shot, that's who killed Bill. She killed a couple of your predecessors, too. She's been disturbing this lighthouse for who knows how long, and she's finally gone. I may have weakened her, but I would have died had you not been there. You're the reason we live another day. Don't forget that. I tried to settle empathy into my tongue. She looked like she wanted to say something, but shook her head instead. Hey, you mind if I hold your hands? Not in a weird way or anything. It's just, you remind me of my dad. When I get scared as a kid, he'd hold my hand to help me relax. And I... I cut her off. I could tell she was about to over-explain to avoid making things awkward. Don't worry. I don't mind. My mom used to do the same thing with me. She rolled over close enough to grab my hand. Thank you. I blushed a bit. Yeah, of course. It was an involuntary gesture. When she first showed up, I didn't really pay attention to her appearance. But given the circumstances, I actually looked at her, and not with a haze to prevent attachment, but actually at her. Her long black hair that glistened in the lighthouse lighting, her gray eyes looked longingly towards the shore. The freckles from spending too much time in the sun, the baggy clothing hanging from her frame. I could tell Griselda was a long way from home. I was sure she felt it now more than ever. I'd appreciate it if you stopped looking at me like that. I hadn't realized she'd turned to me. Sorry. It's been a while since I looked at someone at anything more than, well, some doomed person. Not too sure why I didn't notice before. I turned back to the ocean, trying to avoid her gaze. Must be from all the dead people. She let out a breath through her nose. Yeah, maybe. An hour passed in silence when she set her mug down and rolled away from me. I'm going to get some sleep. Wake me up if something happens. Trust me, if something's happening, the beeping will wake you up. I chuckled to myself, turning to look back out to the window. I gazed over at the ocean, watching as the waves formed and collapsed under themselves. Griselda, I need help down here. I screamed up the stairway. Coming. A few moments later, the sound of boots on metal met my ears. A blur quickly followed. Before I knew it, she had the succubus in a leg choke hold on the ground. Holy fuck. Thanks. I quickly situated the neck snare around the escapee's throat. How'd you get out? I asked, getting the shade on her feet and taking her to a new cell. Oh, come on. Why does any of that matter? Don't you wanna... Just tell me. I'm not playing games. If you weren't willing, I can have her put a bullet through your head. I turned the demon to Griselda, who had the cell block gun in her hand. I think it was a power short of something. She sighed. Great. That wasn't so hard, now was it? I turned the shade back the other way. Check and make sure no others got out. If you see any outside their cell, feel free to put a bullet in their head. It'll get into their bloodstream fastest that way. Aye, aye, Captain, Griselda retorted sarcastically. Shoving the succubus into a new cell, I made sure the door locked behind her. Next time, just holler, 
and I might not put a bullet through. A gunshot rang out. Your head. Turning back to the entrance, I saw the second floor was open, which explained why the sound was quieter than it should have been. Two more shots rang out, causing me to make my way down to floor two. What was left was far more blood than I expected. Griselda turned to meet my gaze. Oh, hey, a tranquilizer didn't work, so I had to put him down. Isn't everything here supposed to be military grade? I observed the obliterated corpse, which seemed to be a dead shapeshifter mid-transition, or one of those deep-sea abominations we get washed up from time to time. That was about the time I finished processing what she said to me. That military grade just means it's twenty years old and prone to breaking due to poor maintenance and constant use, but the wiring should be up to date. They did some work about a month before you got here. Maybe it's due to the cold. What if there's a leak in the cable and it rusted? She began heading back up, and I followed close behind. That's a possibility, but again, it seems like something they would have noticed. I'll call them on the emergency line. I should be able to get a hold of the electricians. She pulled the lever to close off the staircase. Should we, though? I paused in place, the grimace taking over my face. What, you think we should just let them all go? That's not exactly what I'm saying. You remember what I told you about Megami, right? Saying the siren's name sent a shiver down her spine. She murdered Bill, my mentor. Do you understand the repercussions of what you're suggesting? Hear me out, Xavier. I know he meant a lot to you, but when you stop to think about it, this lighthouse is why he was killed. No. If Shades weren't so aggressive, he wouldn't... Her tone ticked up. If it was never built, he wouldn't have worked here, and she wouldn't have had a reason to kill him. It's... it's what? I turned to face her directly, throwing my hands up. It's his fault for getting a job here? Get off your fucking high horse, Grizz. Her slap damn near put me on my ass, shutting me up. It's your turn to listen, all right? You won't let me explain myself. I'm trying to make you understand my point. It's the government's fault. Don't you get it? Whatever they're doing with the shades, they need this lighthouse to collect them. The lighthouse attracts, we contain, the government collects. Don't you get the moral implications in that? We're luring conscious beings here to put them in prison and have the governments do whatever kind of messed up experimentation on them. Bill's body flashed in my mind, intestines loose. I heard his words. You gotta stay strong, because if you don't, more people are just gonna die. Blinking the tears back, I spoke. You don't get it. No matter what we do, the government won't stop. This is the U.S. we're talking about. They don't even give up if oil is on the line. This is one lighthouse out of who knows how many. It won't make a difference, even if you blow this entire place to hell. But we can at least make this place worthless. No matter what we do, it won't matter. Griselda tackled me to the ground. My head bounced off the ground. I was disoriented. She was talking, but I couldn't process her words as I fought for control of the situation. What started as directionless fighting on the grass morphed into a grappling match. After some time, I finally began understanding her. I don't know how else to make you understand. No, I don't know how to make you understand. They'll rebuild this place and have inexperienced kids running this place. There will be so much more death. She wrestled back control. Sure, human lives, but how many shades could we save? They can't all be dangerous. What if they're only hostile because of the methods we use? I narrowly blocked her arm from going around my throat. Are you really going to try to defend the shades over humans here? After all the death they've caused. Not even just here. Through all of time. They're murderers. Griselda had managed to knock down both my arms as she began choking me out. They want to survive, same as us. Humans don't question killing a cow to get its meat, but the moment something else comes around and eats a human, we need to hunt it to extinction. It's fucked up. The world is natural, no matter how crazy it is. It's sad when people die, sure, but you're going to suffer the rest of your life just to prevent the suffering of others. I began missing whole sentences as I struggled for one more breath. 
It isn't like the government is kidnapping people. They're willingly applying and getting a job. I don't you remember when I got here? But I knew what I was signing up for. I lay there, vision blurring, heart slowing, a trickle beginning to stream out of my nose. I kicked, trying to break free. All sounds left me, as darkness consumed me. Regaining consciousness, I found myself on my bed, thirsty as hell with a splitting headache, turning the well-lit room into a tanning bed. I squeezed my eyes shut, trying to remember what led me here. I couldn't remember laying in bed. The last thing in my memory was hazy, but it felt like it happened outside. Getting out of bed left me with an uncomfortable soreness in my muscles. I tried to open my eyes as few times as possible while stumbling my way down the stairs. I felt emotionally drained for some reason I couldn't understand, but I must have something to do with my spotty memory. Maybe once I get some water, it'll come to me. I finally reached the last step and began shambling over to the kitchen. First, reaching into the med cabinets above the stove. I popped a couple Advil and immediately forced my head under the faucet to force as much water down as I could. I reached for the paper towels, gasping for air. As I leaned on the counter, I began drying off my face. Then, I just stood there, staring out the reflective window. I was trying to process what I was seeing when I realized... Griselda! I immediately fell into a coughing fit, my vocal cords not yet ready for the abuse. My headache immediately went into overdrive as my coughing ended. Yeah, dickhead. Lighthouse is on. She called out from up the stairs. Her aggressive behavior knocked something loose in my memory. While the fight was blurry, I could make out what we've been arguing about. Now clear-headed for the most part, I could tell I was being a pretty big asshole. Granted, Griselda had some stuff that was uncalled for and tackled me to the ground, which caused a rough grappling match to ensue, but I knew I would needed to apologize. But first, I had to drop by the restroom. Shutting the door behind me, I immediately pulled down my pants. About fifteen minutes later, I was washing my hands and reached into the cabinet. At the top was a small bottle of pills. I cursed myself as I pulled it down. I stared at the container for a few minutes, wondering why I planned on quitting. Shaking the bottle made a light, rattling sound. Maybe when this one's empty. I mean, I can't have any going to waste. I spent a lot of money to get it here, so it only makes sense to use it all. Opening the cap, I poured two pills into my hand and threw them back, the dry texture carving a path down my throat. Leaving the bathroom, I made my way upstairs to meet with Griselda, hoping she'd accept my apology. Reaching the top step, I saw her sipping a mug of coffee, overwatching the forming and collapsing waves making their way to shore. We need to talk about earlier, Griselda stated, slowly turning in her chair. I was thinking the same thing. I began making my way over to her. I wanted to apologize for how I lashed out at you. There's no need for that. I took it too far, acting like Bill was just a nobody. I should have understood how much you cared about him and respected those boundaries. I appreciate the apology, but... I rubbed the back of my neck. I should have had more control over my emotions. I know you weren't harboring any malice towards me or him. You were just being pragmatic. So, I'm sorry. I gotta be honest, I think I got all my anger out earlier. Feel free to have a seat. I shambled my way over, headache beginning to subside. Yeah, I think I did too. I really hope we don't get into a grappling match every time we have a disagreement. She let out a breathy snort. Yeah, we might end up killing each other one of these days if that ends up being the case. A few minutes passed in thick silence. The air felt solid. So, are you still on the side of the government, or what? I tumbled the question around in my aching mind. Can I take a rain check on that one? I'm still thinking about our conversation. Griselda immediately bolted for the stairs. 
Stay up here where you wake up. Then she was gone. I felt for my ear, but there was nothing in it. So that's what's going on. Feeling around, I noticed I didn't have any of my usual stuff. With my headache beginning to subside, I ran around the lighthouse, checking each floor for any of my stuff. Eventually, I found it all on the desk next to my bed. Of course, the place I didn't check. I put my earbud in, put my neck snare and gun in its holster, then headed down right as I heard Griselda scream. I swung open the doors to find her pinned under a lanky man wearing a top hat shrouded in black. What the fuck? I let out, before shooting the man twice, but he just stood there, unaffected, staring at me. Shit, a spirit. Griselda, keep it busy. Ten steps ahead of you. She grunted, right before a cracking sound reverberated, shortly after a pained hurry. Could be heard as I ran up the lighthouse. Running to the top, I slammed the yellow button and slammed my eyes shut. Once the light had relaxed, I opened my eyes. What's the deal with all the spirits recently? We didn't have a single one until Bill died. Now two in just a few months. Something isn't right. Could it be a test? There was a stumbling sound coming from the stairway, and reality hit me. Running down the stairs, I helped Griselda to her bed. She was bleeding profusely, bruises everywhere, one of her molars missing. Once I set her on the mattress, I ran to the bathroom. I'm getting the med kit. Don't fall asleep. The med kit under the bathroom sink hadn't been used in a while, which meant we were pretty well stocked. Hurrying back to her, I began prepping the supplies. Are you queasy at all? Have you puked? No. No, I I'm fine. Her eyes weren't focused on any single spot, but they weren't dilated. I'd sure hate seeing you when you're bad. She let out a short breath of air. Did you get any cuts on your back? I don't think so, but I can't say for sure. Everything kind of just hurts. I finished wrapping a bandage around a gash in her shin. Can you take aspirin? Yeah, but I feel like a bottle of whiskey would be better. I forced a chuckle. I'll be right back with some water. The sound of feet on metal reverberated around me, only stopping while getting the water and giving Griselda the glass. Here, take these two, I stated, handing her a couple pills. Doing so reminded me of the canister Bill had left me. I'll be right back. Sit tight. I got something else for you. Heading to my bed, I grabbed Bill's old bag out from underneath. After rifling around it for a bit, I found the small container I'd been looking for. Opening the top, I popped one of these slightly glowing crystals into my hand and put everything away. I headed back to Griselda right after. Here, take this with some water too. She took it without hesitation. I just remember, be yourself. When am I not? She coughed out. You remember the conversation from before, don't you? I nodded as I sat at the foot of her bed. Well, I just wanted to say I'm still holding strong by what I said. If we weren't here, I wouldn't be like this right now. I know you want to stick by what your mentor taught you, but you, she yawned. You need to be able to think for yourself, you know? Just like that, she was out like the lighthouse. I wanted to be angry, but I knew she was onto something. Bill had worked here for decades, doing something for that long is bound to leave you with biases. While I had watched him get murdered in front of me, it was true. If the government hadn't built this place to begin with, he wouldn't have died how he did. I sighed, putting my hand over my face. Man, what are we gonna do? Dropping my hands to my side, I glanced at Griselda. Even if we could blow this place up, where are we gonna get explosives? I trailed off, my mind wandering to the laptop. Shit, am I really considering this? I thought to myself as I made my way downstairs. Walking out of the door, I found myself contemplating. Shades aren't human, I can say that much, but don't they have humanity? 
are they capable of such humane behavior, despite being what they are? I found myself rubbing the fifty-pound dumbbell on the dumbbell rack as I gazed out over the calm ocean. What would it mean for everyone on shore if we set all the shades free? Would they simply go back to where they came from? If they can be like us, wouldn't that mean they would likely hold a grudge, just like I would had I been lured and trapped by one of them? Though, if I would feel the same way, that must mean they're justified in their anger, right? And to be completely fair, I've never seen one not under the influence of the lighthouse, so could that mean they aren't as dangerous as I thought? Glancing over to the false floor panel, a crazy thought jolted my mind to alertness. What if I let them all go? Would they let me off scot-free, or would they rip me apart? I gazed longingly at the shack. I mean, the power to the cells is coming from the lighthouse, isn't it? I mean, even if it isn't, I'm sure I could find a way to dismantle the electricity right as the lighthouse blows up. But then, how would we escape? Making my way to the shack, I'd come to a decision. Was it the best plan? No. Was it a good plan? Doubtful. Would we end up dying? Most probably. But there may be a way to end all of this, at least to this location. As I stared at the contents of the safe, my heart rate picked up. If I'm going to do this, I'll definitely need to hire someone to bring supplies. Fortunately, I knew just the sights to get it all here discreetly, and in a few hours. The freezing wind from outside bit at my face as I stood in front of the door. Hello, I'm here with FetchQuest to deliver an order. Are you Xavier Corton? The seven-foot-tall Latino man stood there, a glazed look in his eye as he looked down at the clipboard in his hand. There were two packages at his feet, illuminated only by the light from within the lighthouse. A large wooden crate in a box just big enough to hold a softball. Yeah, that's... All right, please sign at the bottom, sir. He held out the clipboard and pulled a pen from the front pocket of his official fetch quest tee. Right, um, of course... Signing across the bottom, a thought permeated the ducts of confusion in my mind. Don't you want to know what's... You have a right to what you do here, sir. I'm just trying to do my job. Have a good night. He rudely plucked the pen from my hand and turned away, heading to his boat. You too, dickhead. Normally, employees would ask me all sorts of questions about what I do here, and that was when I was just ordering Adderall. Not to mention this latest delivery, though I suppose they may just not know what they deliver. Regardless, I needed to start preparing. The moment the government sees how much money was pulled out of my account, they'll surely be sending someone to find out what I bought. Picking up the crates, I wondered if it would be enough. It had only been about 25 pounds, and I was really just guessing on how much I needed. Dropping the boxes on the kitchen table, I headed to the shed to grab a crowbar. Returning, I set the small box off to the side before prying the top open, the odor of almonds hitting me in the face. Is the smell usually this strong? I wondered to myself as I looked down at the white substance. They were individual one-pound bricks of C4. A remote sat atop all the bricks, a pack of energizer batteries in a box beside it, and it even came with an instruction manual. Who knew? Uh, granted, I doubt they would come with a manual in the military. If you're holding this stuff, you typically have experience. A manual outlined things like how to target weak points, how far away you should be before activating it, uh, basically everything FetchQuest needed to tell you to ensure you were alive enough to continue buying from them. Obviously, getting a hold of C4 is extremely difficult, even if you were to purchase from FetchQuest, assuming you could find it. There's a bunch of psychiatric tests, background checks, and you even have to talk with one of their on-hand psychiatrists. It's for those reasons it took five days to buy all 25 pounds of Uncle Sam's wrath. 
Griselda didn't seem any closer to waking up, unfortunately, which was bad news if it meant I had to shoo us both out of there. Regardless, I had to begin preparations. One of the files Bill had left for me outlined how basically everything running to and from the lighthouse was tracked by government officials. However, FetchQuest has a special encryption system that meant the only thing the suits can see was how much I spent. And even then, that was because they had full access to my bank accounts. If the spending of over four grand on unknown items didn't get their attention, then the transferring of all my funds to a special currency owned by FetchQuest was sure to send them heading straight here. My best estimate was that I'd have an hour to set up all 25 bricks of C4, have Griselda out of the lighthouse, and ensure I had everything I needed. Then they'd be coming straight for me. I patted myself down, ensuring I had my gun. Heading up to my bed, I pulled out Bill's old laptop from under it. I sat down, looking over a few of the messages he'd left for me one last time. A tear escaped my eye as I read over the line again. Keep your head held high. You're remarkable, kid. With that, I shut the laptop, walked it right downstairs, and promptly threw it out the kitchen window, a splash accompanying the sound of the window sliding shut. Heading to my bag, I made sure I had the bare essentials. Anything that could be tracked went into a trash can, along with a healthy splash of gasoline. Credit card, debit card, Walgreens reward card, all of it. After starting the trash can up, I got to doing the same with the bag I'd packed for Griselda. Putting them both on, I packed up Griselda, taking her outside, and leaning her against the outside wall. Gazing up. I wondered if the lighthouse being off would mean they'd be coming sooner. I shook it off, clapping my hands and saying aloud to myself, Let's get this shit done. First thing to take care of was setting up the EMP. Assuming they'd dock at the prison section before the wooden docks, I'd have more time to set up the C4 with the disruption down below. Heading inside, I opened the package for the EMP. The device was smaller than I expected, about as thick as a book. The device was no larger than one of those yes buttons. It was a stainless steel color and had nothing more than three buttons and a small display on it. Turning it on, I set the timer for 30 minutes, immediately heading to the prison and pulling the lever. I'd intended to just use a remote to activate it when I was ready, but electronic signals couldn't make it through the floor panel. Which was good, because hopefully that meant the EMP would be confined to the two cell blocks, but I couldn't be certain. As I walked down the stairs, I could hear a few sets of shades talking amongst themselves. Pulling the lever for the second floor, I began. Attention, shitheads and none alike. I've got an announcement for all of you. There was some groaning, but I was mostly just getting cussed out. All right, if you don't want to go free, you're more than welcome to stay. Turning around, I heard some shuffling, then one shouted. What's the catch, huh? The voice was painfully gravelly. It shocked me a bit to hear they could yell that loud. All right, I've struck your interest, I take it. After I received their affirmations, I continued. In a little while here, there's going to be some government officials coming to take Griselda and I out. That's because of a little surprise party I'm throwing for them. The fireworks are going to be unlike anything you've ever seen. But what they don't realize is I'm expecting them. I held up the device. This thing here is called an EMP. In other words, this thing goes off, you're all set free. Simple as that. There were some excited murmuring sounds from the back. However, I have a few conditions, because I've got more than enough C4 to just blow this prison up and leave you all to drown. Well, most of you. A hush fell over the prison. The only sounds that remained was a small echo which was quickly dying off. Quite frankly, I think we can all benefit from our current predicament. This device will go off 30 minutes from when I arm it. That's when I expect the suits to be arriving. Do I make myself clear? There were some affirmation sounds. Good. Here are the conditions, then. 1. Under no circumstances are any of you to harm me nor Griselda. 2. You can kill anyone else you feel like. In fact, I say go nuts. 3. Once I finish everything I'm doing, I'll open the floor panel, and you can all go wherever you want. 
There were scattered conversations. Then the gravelly voice from earlier spoke up. We are responsible for non-sentient atypicals. The word choice caught me off guard. If you mean the primal shit, sure. There aren't many of them, and I can put one or two down if need be. There was a bit more murmuring. The Shade Leader spoke again. How do we know you'll set us free? When the EMP goes off, it's going to kill the locking mechanism to the floor panel too. I'm sure once that happens, you guys will be able to break it yourselves. Now, do we have a deal? Sure. Fuck it. Wonderful. Go nuts. There was a cheering, bashing on cell doors, and a few other noises I'd rather not think about as I set up the EMP on the ceiling of the second floor. I pressed the arm button, and it began ticking down the seconds. Heading straight to the top, I shivered, pulling the lever for the floor panel above ground before heading back to the lighthouse. The C4 was the tricky part. While it came with a manual, I didn't know where to find the weaker points of a fucking lighthouse, and had already tossed my only access to the internet. So instead, I decided to place it around just far apart enough that I could fit 12 pounds around the circumference of the inside and 13 around the outside. By the time I finished, I could smell the stuff on my hands. I'd already moved Griselda and all of our belongings next to the docks before loading the batteries into the remote and ensuring it was wirelessly connected to the receiver. That was when I noticed a white flake pass by my face. It startled me for a second as I tried to figure out what it was, but as more flakes began to fall, I looked up, seeing snow clouds overhead, obscuring the moon. Smiling, I kind of just took it in for a moment, trying to appreciate the rare weather phenomena. I wondered how much time had passed. Surely it had been longer than thirty minutes by now, so... A bang on the floor panel shot me out of my thoughts. It was rapid, sporadic and loud. Cautiously, I put the transmitter in my pocket, exchanging it for my gun, something far more useful given the situation. Aiming it down to the fake grass, I pulled the lever. In hindsight, the panel must have functioned by gears, that's the only reason I can think of for its opening with just as much ease as any other time I'd gone into the prison. The shades didn't hesitate to burst out the moment they could squeeze through the opening. There were wings, fins, arms, beaks, blood, guts, the sound of splashing, and then... nothing. The sound of waves licking the island was all that could be heard. The sound of metal on metal reverberated from below, and I readied my pistol. Hey now, I thought you were gonna let me go free. The gravelly voice I'd negotiated with previously scraped up from beneath the panel. I've never been one for standing the moment the plane lands. I prefer the chaos be past me before bothering. The metal clinking stopped as the gaunt, wrinkly, but surprisingly well-dressed man reached the grass. His checkered jacket and bleached white khakis spoke for themselves. They're all dead down there, by the way. And if you're wondering... They have reinforcements coming. I think they said something about being five minutes out. I'd stay to hell, but that wasn't part of the deal. The man turned away, heading to the edge of the island, and simply walked off. I was frozen. We'd had a slow week after all the preparations. I had to leave the lighthouse off almost all week. But despite that, I knew for certain I never captured that man. It was only when I heard the engines of motorboats that my mind kicked back into gear. I charged back to the docks. There were men in some sort of combat armor driving them. That was when I realized the futility of our situation. I expected a boat with a few feds, maybe, but this was more than I could handle. As they approached, I threw a blanket I'd brought over Griselda's head, dropping to the ground and pulling the transmitter out of my hand, pressing the button for detonation. I barely got my hands over the back of my neck before the explosion sounded. I only heard the first second or so of the explosion before everything went silent, and fluid began seeping from my ears. 
The air pressure hit me simultaneously, launching hot shards of steel and concrete straight into my skin. What followed shortly thereafter was a series of gusts of wind, followed by more debris slicing me up. When the wind had settled, I slowly opened my eyes, first glancing at the now collapsed pile of rubble. I couldn't believe it. The lighthouse was actually gone. I then glanced around Griselda and I. There were a few large hunks of reinforced concrete sticking out of the ground. I'd been careless, but our luck saved us. That was when I felt myself being yanked to my feet, metal wrapped around my wrists, and I was spun around to see a man screaming at me. I just looked at him in confusion. The man grabbed my face, turned it to each side. He turned to a soldier on his left, still holding my face, and said something. Then, he sprayed something in my face, and I was out cold. The room I awoke in was disorienting. I blinked hard a few times, trying to get some foggy fluid out of my eyes. I tried reaching up to rub them, but my hands were chained to an interrogation table. I blinked a few more times, my vision finally clearing. I felt off, a little looser than usual. It was almost a drunken sensation. I was kind of just looking at the white wall, giggling. When I looked to my right, I saw my reflection, which sobered me up a bit. I had stitches and bandages scattered across my arms, neck, and face. Before I could inspect any further, the door on the left opened, revealing a white-haired suit with a mustache that screamed Sam Elliott. He promptly removed his sunglasses, hanging them over his white undersuit. The smile that followed suit sobered me up, making me want to sock him in the face. Where? I burst into a coughing fit, my throat far too dry to be screaming. Where's Griselda? And that ain't none of your business. See, what we're trying to figure out is why you're being so reckless. The pay was good, you were protecting people, keeping the shit that kills people out of the city. And yet, despite that, you blew that lighthouse there to smithereens. His southern drawl was palpable, only causing the urge to knock the man out that much stronger. Right, like you couldn't comprehend my reasoning. Given your stance in the situation, I don't think I'll be changing your mind anytime soon. Scooting his chair back, he put his dress-shoed feet on the table, proceeding to lean back and put his hands behind his head. Well, it ain't so much you changing my mind I care about, more of, uh, information, I suppose. I mean, hell, where on earth could you have gotten C4 without leaving the island? Our scans show no planes, not even boats. He hesitated when I looked away. Ah, oh, so it was delivered by boat, then. How interesting. How did... Now, Xavier, I do believe I made it clear who's asking the questions. He turned to his left, staring at the mirror. Did I not make myself clear? The intercom came to life. Yes, sir, you did. See? Now, back to the matter at hand. I do believe you have information on who you got them explosives from exactly... I'd much appreciate you handing that over willingly. I'd prefer to negotiate, you see, but I'm not above getting my hands a little dirty from time to time. Wouldn't that be police brutality? Pretty sure that's a federal offense. He snickered, which slowly turned into cackling. You think we're police officers, don't you? He turned back to the mirror. Get a load of this guy. Thinks he's in a police station right now. Facing me again, he spoke. No, 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 you don't get it. This is what you might call a federal experimentation center. Same place we take, well, what I think Bill called them was, uh, shades. Am I right? Clicking my tongue, I sneered. You're treading dangerous waters there. You sure you want to go there? The man chuckled. Well... Those handcuffs have held stronger shades than you in place. Putting his feet down, he leaned in. I'm not too worried about a failed lighthouse attendant. He tipped back into his chair. Listen, you play ball with us and we'll let you go free. Quite frankly, we've been shutting down lighthouses along the coast 
We just don't need them anymore. But your little light show made things a bit more complicated. Thankfully, we got everything sorted, but it was a close call to be sure. All I want to know is where you got them explosives. Tell me that, and I'll be sure to let you go free. And Griselda. Who? Oh, uh, of course. We just need to get some information out of you first, of course. I looked him up and down. All right, I can see why you may not be so trusting, but just know, we really don't want any harm to come to y'all. We have our objectives, and killing people ain't exactly part of them. Now, if you please, tell me why you decided to blow the building to hell. Did it have something to do with Bill? I shuddered, glaring at him. You're stepping into muddy water again. He held up his hands in a fake defensive manner. Hey now, I think that's reasonable. Just drop the act. One minute you told me you weren't scared, the next you're feigning fear. He put his hands down, face becoming more neutral. If you must know. Yeah, it was partially Bill, I guess, in a sense. But quite frankly, it was largely the inhumanity of it all. I came to the realization what we were doing was unethical. That's all. I avoided eye contact as I finished. That's a rather specific change of heart, wouldn't you agree? And just after spending quite some time with a new individual, you think she may have uh, had something to do with this sudden change of heart? I looked him in the chin. Can't say I exactly agree with that conclusion. I mentally kicked myself as I finished. And saying it ain't exactly that leads me to believe she planted the seed. Would I be correct? I couldn't think of a response. Well then, that is rather interesting. Yes, we should be more careful about the morality of future subjects. I stared him dead in the eye. My face reddening. What the fuck do you mean? I burst into another coughing fit with the end of my question. Well, quite simply, I was lying to you before. We'll always have need for them lighthouses. I just... You know what? Never mind. I've gotten everything I need now. I sure as hell hope to never see you again. Finishing, he stood putting his glasses back on and exiting the room, leaving me to fume in my ignorance. The next few days were a fog. Everything after the conversation was simply vague ideas of distant emotions, coupled with a few frames of either nightmares or a horrifying reality. But when I eventually found myself fully conscious, nothing was familiar. The room was bland, a hardwood floor, white walls, a couple windows in the back of the room, metal bars covering them. Across from the windows laid a door, a big metal one, not unlike the ones in schools. There was even metal netting in the glass. Then, just beside my bed, there was a small desk with a notebook and a rubber pen. Standing, I felt the muscles in my legs reject the motion. They were stiff, and the aching in my body felt odd. I looked myself over, noticing a few scars lining my arms where I'd previously had stitches. That was when I noticed my clothes, a grey tee and grey sweatpants, without a string, along with a pair of gripped socks. I didn't even own sweatpants, let alone the type of socks I was wearing. Pulling up my right pant leg, there were multiple larger scars, a couple of which were still scabbed over. Guess the explosion did more damage than I expected. Media doesn't give C4 nearly enough respect. I laughed to myself, breaking into a small coughing fit. That was when someone opened the door. She looked at me, and I dropped my pant leg. Bed check. Uh, oh, uh, you're already up and at it. Uh, good morning. The woman smiled sweetly at me, closing the door. Wait, where the fuck am I? She pushed the door back open, looking at me with that ever-present smile, but I could see mild concern behind her eyes. You're at Hollowood Hospital. I'm sure you remember signing yourself in. I apologize, but I need to check on the other patients. 
If you have any questions, there are plenty of other nurses to ask around. She closed the door behind her, but not before giving me another kind-hearted smile. After giving myself a full-body inspection, I sat on my bed, trying to figure out what was going on. Where am I? How long have I been here? Who put me here? Upon asking myself the last question, my mind shot to the southerner with the far too familiar mustache. It must have been them. It makes the most sense. But then, where did they put me? She said hospital, but that can't be right. Nothing around here gave off the feel of a typical hospital. But where else could I be? They must have given me some sort of... My mind stopped. Oh God, where's Griselda? I shot out of bed, flinging my door open. Whoa there, mister. You ought to be more careful. It was another nurse. Sorry, but is Griselda here? I need to know. She's... Sir, I need to ask you to calm down. You're startling some of our patients. I stared her in the eyes for a moment, noticing she was looking to her left. Looking to my right, I noticed I'd attracted some attention. It was mostly just some disturbance but a couple people seemed to curl up in their distress. I apologize, miss. I just want to know if a girl named Griselda is being held here. I'm sorry, but that name doesn't ring a bell. If she is here, she would be in the female wing, not here. All at once, a sort of disorientation fell over me. Okay. Thank you. I lost my sense of focus. Walking to the TV room, I dropped down on the couch, next to a guy I had spooked earlier. I gazed at the TV, lost in thought. How did I fuck up so hard? How the hell am I supposed to fix this? Can I fix this? Griselda is out there, somewhere, and she could very well be in the same situation as me. There's no guarantee, but what's obvious is, I don't belong here. Yet, I am. Following that logic... Zelda is either in the same position as me, or one even worse. Oi, Xavier, how you doing, mate? An Australian accent knocks me out of my days. I looked up to my left, hoping to find the source of the noise. Um, hey, um, who are you? He chuckled to himself. Oh, yeah, you said something about that. My name's Clyde. You forgot who I was again? Yeah, um, I guess so. When did we meet? I think we might want to go back to my room, yeah? Frying ears ain't great for honesty around here. Cautiously, I stood. What do you mean? Well, if I tell you now, that'll kind of defeat the purpose, yeah? A sense of unease came over me, as if my brain knew something it couldn't translate for me yet. Yeah, sure. I gestured for him to lead the way, and he started down the hallway I'd initially come from. A few rooms down from mine, he opens the door, gesturing for me to go first. The moment he closed the door behind us, I felt a mild gust on my neck. Immediately, I grabbed his arm, spun him around, pulling it around his neck. Damn, I yield, holy fuck! Letting go of his arm, he began rubbing his shoulder. Uh, Sorry, I just... I guess I'm a little paranoid. I chuckled to myself, keeping my eyes on him. Well, no shit. It's a nice move you got, though. Can't imagine where you got them. He bellowed, holding out his hand. After giving it a firm shake, he continued, heading to his bed. But in all seriousness, there's some whack shit going on. You were telling me about some lighthouse yesterday. You remember that? Uh, yeah, there... I mean... No, I don't remember, but I know what you're talking about. My job, or, or uh, I guess, old job now, uh, capturing shades for the government. Yeah, I never worked in capturing anything, but I saw shit on the police force. Told them I wouldn't ignore it, ended up here. As far as I can tell, they've been trying to give me meds and shit, but they haven't done shit for me. That's how I know it ain't just imaginary. Then you showed up, screaming about zombies and sirens and shit. Almost felt like a sign, you know? He was giving me crazy eyes and laughing a little too much. 
and I began wondering if I'd really trusted this guy with anything. Glancing around, I tried to pick up on anything that might tell me for sure if this guy was crazy or not. That's when my gaze focused on something under his bed. It was a pill. Of course, I couldn't be sure. I mean, they tell me I had schizophrenia, so I can't say whether or not any of it happened, you know? I slowly began stepping back, trying to avoid any potential physical conflict. Standing, he began walking toward me. Come on now, let's just talk about it. The people here don't know what they're talking about. Guy, you're creeping me out, and I'd really rather not hurt you. So either let me leave, or I'll put your ass on the ground. He froze. So, you understand me then? His eyes went gentle and saddened. Yeah. Yeah, sorry for bothering you. I quickly left the room, taking a glance around. Most people seemed to still be in the TV room, but one guy with black hair and their hands in their pockets was walking just a few feet away. Hey, buddy! The man picks up the pace, quickly disappearing into a hallway. I ran for them, knowing they must have just heard what went down. As I rounded the hallway on my right, I found him standing next to a door on my left. Turning to me, he smiled. His face was a bit wrinkled and sun-damaged with a five o'clock shadow, his smile filled with crooked teeth. He wore the same get-up as me, his voice implying he came somewhere from Central America. Hey man, I hope you don't mind, but... I was listening in on you two. Yeah, I pieced as much together. Why? What'd you find so interesting, huh? Well, I'm sensing some hostility. He put his hands up in a jokingly defensive manner as he leaned against the wall. Because I heard your outburst when they wheeled you in. Thought you were just plain crazy. Well, till you said something that caught my attention. About uh, the lighthouse that brings him in. Look, I've been a part of a bunch of circles, and the only time I heard about things like that is when suits bring in some crazy guy. Hold up, who else here knows about this shit? He sighed. He got taken on back a few years ago, sorry to tell you. And the one before him, well, he got taken out about five years before that. I had a feeling the government isn't too fond of keeping people like that around. So, what's your deal, then? Uh, I had a run-in with some shit about ten years ago, landing me in here. I mean, he cut himself off. And just after that, I threw down an ace and won everything. A nurse turned the corner just then, smiling at both of us. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Miss Tabitha. Hope you're doing well, the man replied. I'm doing wonderfully, Cole. I hope you have a great rest of your day. She waved us off as she continued on her way. Once she was out of earshot, Cole continued. I mean, I used to be a contract killer, but, uh... He looked uncomfortable as he remembered something. This guy hired me for a job. I think his name was Brad or Bard or something. I almost put a bullet right between the contractor's eyes... But that was when, well, something else ended up finding me. The guy had to be the luckiest motherfucker, I swear. After I missed my chance and dealt with that, he shuddered. That thing, I put myself here until I got better. But there's another reason I decided to stick around. Did it have something to do with what you saw? He looks to his left and then to his right. No, I never completed that contract. I don't want to know what Brad, Bart, or whatever the fuck his name is will do to me when he figures out where I am. Well, shit, do you have any idea on how to get out of here at least? He scoffed. Yeah, no. Whether or not I believe you've seen some fucked up shit, I saw you when they wheeled you in. I think this place could actually do you some good. Look, man, I took a breath. All right. I know I'm a bit fucked up, but I need to get to Griselda. I don't know where the hell she is. Slow down. He's up there for a second. Who the hell's Griselda? 
I thought for a moment. She's, um, my co-worker, I guess you could say. Well, uh, was, at least. I blew the lighthouse up, so it isn't like she's still there, but I brought her out. She should still be fine. I need to go find her before they kill her or something. Hold on. You blew up the lighthouse? Yes. Where was she? Outside, uh, unconscious. That part's a long story. So they put you here after blowing up the government's lighthouse, which you used to capture and contain entities. We call them shades, but yeah, I also let them all go. And you let them all go. You do all of that and you're still here. Why would they kill her? It was a fair question. It held some weight, hearing it even took a bit of the edge off. Rubbing the back of my head, my hands brushed against something wrapped around my ear. I felt around it. Something was in my ear connected to it. Pulling the earpiece out of my ear, I looked down at it. Is this what I think it is? I could only hear his voice through my left ear. You must have been whacked the fuck out to not know you got ear aids. What the hell do they do to you? I don't know. What day is it? Sunday. And no, what number? And what month? February 17th. Fuck. I gazed up, putting the earpiece back into place. It's been a month since I blew that lighthouse to hell. Damn. Seriously? Uh, no, you don't get it. I'm missing almost a full month of my memory. I don't even feel the withdrawals from the Adderall I was taking. I don't feel the pain from my ears bursting. I only remember a few days before when I blew that place up, and now. I fell against the wall across from Cole, my legs giving out from under me. I couldn't do anything but sit against the wall. As I sat there, I fell into my head, staring up at the ceiling. If Griselda is in the same situation as me, what's going to happen to her? If she doesn't have someone like Cole around, she could already believe everything that happened was just a bunch of vivid hallucinations. She would have been out even longer than me, and wouldn't even know I set up explosives. You need a can? You look like you're about to hurl. My mouth was watering profusely. Please. I had to choke it down a few times, but when he finally got a small trash can between my legs, I vomited. More bile than anything else, but a bit of food from the previous day seems to come up as well. I just... I can't let that happen to her. Hold on. I think you skipped some stuff. Let what happen to who? I can't let them make it Griselda think she's just been crazy this whole time. I don't want that for her. Do you love her or something? I grimaced at the suggestion. Like a sister, yeah. We've only known each other for a couple months or so, but we spent every waking moment together. The air went still. During the silence, I heard a pair of shoes come from down the right side of the hall. This time, a masculine voice greeted me. Are you doing okay, Xavier? Feeling sick? I looked up, giving him a thumbs up. I feel perfectly fine, man. Have the time of my life over here. Here, let's get you to the bathroom. The man tried helping me up. No, really, I'm fine now. It was just about a nausea. Nothing to worry about. I already feel better. He was persistent, and after some back and forth, I was practically forced into the nearest bathroom until he was sure I wasn't going to puke again. Leaving, I tried to find Cole, but no matter where I checked, I couldn't find him anywhere. I didn't want to start peeking into bedrooms in hopes of finding him for obvious reasons, so instead, I just went about the daily shit. Had food, tongued my meds, avoided the crazy Australian guy... Overall, it was an alright day. Toward the end, I had to see a therapist, who I told the complete truth to, despite knowing how he'd see it. It felt good to talk to someone about it in person, no matter how condescending the looks I got were. 
Afterwards, I even had some time to write in my journal. Days passed like this on repeat. I got to talk to Cole from time to time, but it was mostly just casual chit-chat. Even when I tried to bring everything up with him again, he would get a bit anxious and change the subject. As my life fell into this routine, my desire to find an escape route only increased. The therapy sessions were good for my mental health, but the company was less than desirable. Not to mention I had to get to Griselda before they convinced her she was crazy. Despite all that, I could never quite manage a way out. The security was tight as hell, and no matter what skills I'd picked up from Bill, I couldn't take on the night security guards. I didn't have any sort of weapon, and they had billy clubs, tasers, and pepper spray. Ask me how I know. So, as more time passed, I decided the best course of action would just be to play along until I'd convinced them I was no longer delusional. After an indeterminable amount of time, I'd actually started to make progress, too. That's right around when the investigator showed up. He had orange hair with a trimmed three-day beard. He wore a brown cardigan with a white undershirt, black jeans, black tactical boots, and a pair of black metal frame glasses that I was almost positive didn't have prescription lenses. He talked to the people at the front desk before heading down the hall to the cafeteria. One of the male nurses I'd learned was named Julian, then came into the TV room where most everyone was. All right, everybody. We have a detective in today. He'd like to talk with each one of you personally. However, you'll need to go in one at a time to speak with him. So we'll have you go in alphabetical order by first names, all right? There were a few complaining groans, but there wasn't much any of us could do or say. I was next to last, which, while it was nice to not have to deal with the guy for a while, it felt like putting off the inevitable. Most of the guys came back after just a few minutes. That is, except for Cole. They must have talked for a good half hour before he came back, pale as the schizophrenia meds I'd been avoiding. I tried to talk to him about it, but he said he didn't really want to. Eventually, my turn came around. I sighed, hoping to get everything done and over with. When I sat across from the man, he introduced himself. Hello, my name is Detective Simmons. It's nice to meet you. He held out his hand, which I shook as I sat down. Uh, nice to meet you, Simmons. I'm Xavier. I glanced down at his notebook, which was opened to a page of names. I saw a bunch of X's next to most of them, but before I could get a better look, he closed it. Well, Xavier, would you mind telling me what put you here exactly? Do you want the official version or the actual version? He raised an eyebrow. I want to hear your version, if you don't mind. Well, it started with a lighthouse just off the Oregon coast by Tillamook. When I said that, he opened his notebook to a blank page and began writing. I used to capture shades. Um, I guess most people would call them entities. Uh, paranormal shit, if you will. But yeah, I used to capture these shades for the government. The lighthouse would lure them in, and it was my job to lock them up. But one day, I decided to blow the thing to shit. It took 25 pounds of C4. And you said this was where, exactly? He asked, looking up from his notebook. Uh, just off the coast of Tillamook. Or right around there, at least. Well, I'll be. He smirked. Didn't expect another, but he could be helpful around the office. He trailed off, mumbling to himself. <clears throat> he looked back up at me. Oh, sorry. Just got a little lost in thought as well. Please, tell me more about your experiences and what landed you here. After about an hour, he'd filled a couple pages with notes and was getting ready to have the last guy come in when he revealed one last thing to me. He leaned in, gesturing for me to do the same. Be ready tonight. I've got a plan for getting Cole out of here, and if you'd like, you can come with and work for me. Just be at the back door near the garden at midnight. I don't expect an answer now, but your presence will be enough. He leaned back. Anyway, head on out. I've got one last person to talk to. Can I just ask one thing? Why did you believe me? 
We can talk about it all you want if you show. Now head on out of here. I got work to do. Questions swirled in my mind. I did as he said. Instead of heading to the TV room, though, I just went back to mine, laying in bed and thinking. Of course, this is what I wanted. There's no reason to believe he harbors ill intentions. Except, of course, how pale Cole's face was. What would have made him so uncomfortable? Even if it turns out he's trying to kidnap me or something, he's a little smaller than me, both in height and muscle mass. I have no doubt if worse comes to worst, Cole and I could handle him. That being said, there's no guarantee Cole will even show up. A knocking on my door shook me out of my thoughts. Yeah, come in. Cole quickly opened it, shutting it behind him immediately after. He believed you too, didn't he? It took me a second to realize what he was talking about. Uh, oh, uh, you mean Simmons? Yeah, you were talking with him for a while. Look, I'm worried about him. He said he knows what I did, and he's willing to give me a job. Apparently he knows somebody to kill me off legally, so I can lay low without actually having to. But he gave me a weird vibe. You worried he's lying? Because from what I saw, he seemed like he genuinely wanted to help me. Maybe you're just paranoid. I mean, you have been hiding in a mental hospital for over ten years. Yeah, you got a fair point, but even still. Well, I'm going with him. I need to find Griselda. Even if I end up dying, it's better than holding up here hoping they'll actually release me. As for you, I don't mean to try and sway you or anything, but do you really want to just hide out here until you die? I... well, I mean, I guess not. This is now a pictured retirement. Alright, while you think about what you're going to do, I'm having an existential crisis, so if you don't mind... I gestured to the door. He looked at me one more time before leaving. Flopping back on my bed, I just stared at the ceiling. My heartbeat strangely relaxed. I suppose I didn't really have much else to think about, unless I felt like giving myself anxiety. I'd be better off just waiting to see what all went down. It was nearly midnight, and I was hanging around the garden entrance. No guards stood watching there, thanks to the giant electric fence surrounding the enclosure. But even still, if it had been day, there would have been nurses standing, watching to make sure no one did anything stupid. I'd mostly just been going up and down the same hall repeatedly, just waiting for some sort of signal. Checking the clock in the hallway, I still had a couple minutes, and it didn't look like Cole was going to show. I sighed resigning myself to what very well may have been an elaborate kidnapping. Then, I heard the sound of grippy socks on tile. I turned around to see Cole fully tilting it over to me. Reaching the door, he stopped, catching his breath. Good. I'm not late. You aren't indeed. He should be showing up any second. The door to the garden swung open revealing a man in all black tactical gear holding bolt cutters. Let's get the fuck out of here, he whispered, turning back to the way he'd come after giving us a quick look over. Seeing this as our cue, we followed right behind. We had to be careful about some of the guards looking through the windows, but eventually we made it to a door-sized hole in the fence. Considering that, I assumed he must have shut the power to it off, following his lead as quietly as possible which became much more difficult when gravel came into the mix. Let me tell you, the socks you get at a mental institution are great for a lot of things, but they just ain't shoes. A painful few minutes later, we made it to a disturbingly white van just off a back road. Opening the back up, he instructed us to get in. Cole and I looked at each other before hopping in. Simmons headed up front, tossing the bolt cutters back with us. Well, that was... An alarm cut him off. Well, you at least got some shoes back here or something, I asked with mild concern as we shut the door. Yeah, I got clothes for you guys, but you're going to want to buckle up for now. It was only then that I realized the back of the van was lined with four seats on each side. The floor was carpeted, and there were boxes filled with all sorts of supplies. Realizing how bright it was, I looked overhead to see amateurly installed lights. 
Buckling ourselves across from one another, Cole and I looked at each other in the eyes right before Simmons peeled out of the road like a bass during fish season. His fishtail caused much more noise than I remembered tires making. The next ten minutes were full of dizzying turns at unsafe speeds before he eventually stopped, turning back to us. All right, there's clothes and shoes for the both of you in the clothes box back there. Nothing special since I didn't know if I'd actually find you there, Cole, and I didn't expect to see you, Xavier, so I just had to drop by a thrift shop. His face went serious all of a sudden. Now, you guys get dressed, then stay silent. I'll be playing some music until we get to where I'm dropping you guys off. I've got an office, but first you guys will need to get removed from the government's database, so shut up and sit tight. It's going to be a long ride. He definitely wasn't wrong. The ride was excruciating. All we could really do was take intermittent naps and think while piano music played in the background. But as time passed, the light began to shine in. Looking up through the windshield, I was surprised to see as much snow as there was. It was the Rocky Mountains, and considering the time of year, it wasn't that strange, but Simmons never put any chains on. Which is when I remembered all the extra noise the tires had been making the whole trip, but even if he had snow tires, it was way too much snow for them to handle, but I guess he was just too stubborn to be bothered. Luckily, nothing came of it, and we made it down the mountains with minimal sliding. Time continued to pass, and a couple gas station stops later, Simmons was pulling over in front of an old log cabin in the middle of buttfuck nowhere. He hopped out without saying a word, opens the back up, and shot Cole in the neck with something. I covered mine, hoping to avoid the same, but no pain ever came. Calm down, I had to bring him all the way out here as a favor. You can rest assured I do intend to actually hire you. Unbuckling the now unconscious man, Simmons picked him up like it was nothing, carrying him out. It was around this time I began seriously questioning whether or not I should actually stay. The reasonable thing to do was run, but I had no idea where we were, and I had no survival skills to speak of. But if it meant getting taken to some creepy guy's house in the woods, I decided I'd prefer to take my chances with the elements. Unbuckling my seatbelt, I slowly glanced out the back doors. Once I'd confirmed no one was around, I dashed down the gravel path. I was about to head straight into the forest when my muscles stopped responding. I blinked slowly as I came to a shamble. I tried to turn around to see what was going on, but before I could even manage, I collapsed to the ground. When I awoke, I saw metal bars, concrete walls making up the other three sides of me. Laying my head back down onto the bed, I sighed. I really should have seen this fucking coming, huh? Taking a moment, I staggered to my feet. It felt like I had a hangover, just without the headache. Who the hell might I have the privilege of being captured by? I yelled in as stern of a tone as I could manage. My head pounded. A minute or so passed before I heard a door open. Shortly thereafter, Simmons rounded the front of the cell. All right. I know how this looks, trust me, but it isn't what you think. He took a sip from the coffee mug in his hand, which read, World's Best P.I. So, you didn't kidnap Cole and I, human traffic Cole, then proceed to lock me in a sex dungeon? Oh, I owed Brad a favor for some help he gave me a while back. That's the only reason I was able to save you. If I were in your position, I'd be pretty grateful. Cocking my head only slightly, I glared at him down my nose, folding my arms. All right, look, I never lied to you. I do need a new employee, but I couldn't risk you lashing out at me. If you'd like, I can give you some answers. If you trust me after that, I'll let you out. Then we can get all the paperwork signed and get you legally killed. And by that, I mean... If you mean anything but filing me as being reported dead while I am in fact still alive, I don't think we really need to have this conversation. He paused mid-sip. Fair point. He lowered the mug. I considered for a moment. Okay, if I'm going to work with you, I have a couple conditions. We'll see. He gestured for me to continue. 
One, we need to go save Griselda. Two, any questions I have on the way to her, you have to answer. I'm going to come back to your first condition here in a moment, but I'd prefer to specify the second. You may ask me any questions in regards to what we discussed at the mental hospital, and I will be required to answer them. Any other questions you may have, I can't promise I will answer. I sighed. That's fair. Now, as your first condition, I can't guarantee we'll find her. I remember everything you told me at the psych ward, so I know she's important to you. But really, I only found you by dumb luck on your end. We'd have to look into each psych ward database, potentially in the country. I was about to give my two cents when he continued, putting his thumb on his chin. His gaze lowered, eyes glazed over. Unless they don't want to waste many resources, given she was unconscious, they pretty easily could have convinced her everything was a hallucination. He kept talking, but his mumbling had grown too quiet to pick up anything else. After a few minutes, I spoke. So, what are you thinking? He jerked his head to me, taking a few moments to process his surroundings. Oh, right. I think I may have figured out how to find where she is. Not the exact location, but how to narrow it all down. Pulling a keychain from his back pocket, he inserted a key into my door. I'm going to need your help. Any good with computers? Wait, we're really doing this? Assuming you can help me. He paused, key still in the lock. Yeah. I cracked my knuckles. I know my way around the interwebs. God, I hope that was a joke. He said, defeated, unlocking the door. I followed him through the door he'd come in before. It was a sort of office. There was a door at the front, but it had a wall between it and the rest of the office with a fogged glass pane. A couple tinted windows in the front let in a small amount of light, and the rest of the walls were lined with hard wood up to about three feet, with the rest being covered in that cheap paint that's basically a paste when you put it on. There was a desk in the middle of the room with a computer and a filing cabinet. Then, toward the back where we were, there were a couple other desks, each with their own PC and assortment of miscellanea. Well, that's my office. Pick one of those two desks. The computers are both on fresh installs. You'll need to clear whichever you choose, though. Oh, I'm going to need your phone number, and you're going to need a new email. Once you've got everything set up, I'll email you everything I need in order to get an exact location on Griselda. Now, I won't bore you with all the tedious work we put in, but suffice to say, it took a few days of coffee and very little food or sleep. Essentially, they've moved her a couple of times after the break-in and were planning to move her again. So our goal was to catch her right after they dropped her off. Given the location, we had some time to catch up on sleep. By the time we woke up, she was already in transport, and we had eight hours before midnight. We didn't do too much. We showered in the back room, did our laundry, and just generally got cleaned up. What I hadn't noticed when I was locked up was that the back room was essentially his bedroom, minus the fridge and freezer, which I had learned was actually inside one of his desk cabinets. He definitely wasn't living the life of luxury, but it seemed like he was happy. I mean, aside from his practically daily night terrors and clear PTSD. After a while, though, the time had finally come. We were going to save Griselda. And then I could finally get my life back on track. We both could. On the drive, I finally had time to ask some questions. Alright, I have to know. Why did you believe me before? Uh, back at the mental hospital, I mean. Huh. Oh, that. Because I saw it on a tiny news station. It only aired in a few minor locations, and I've got contacts that keep eyes on that sort of thing. They said there was a lighthouse that had blown up off the coast of Talamook. Claimed it was a terrorist attack, but who the fuck ever heard of a terrorist attack in Oregon? Of course, I still looked into it. Turned out there was a residue that indicated C4 had been used to blow it up. Not only that, the lighthouse was still in operation, and local scans revealed an underwater building of some sorts. 
So when you told me about how you blew up that lighthouse, I figured you couldn't possibly have learned so much about it from inside a psych ward. I took a chance, albeit a small one, and turned out my hunch was correct. Well, damn. And given I told you about how we captured Shades, I assume you've seen some shit yourself. He hesitated, as if debating whether or not to tell me. Well, yeah, I guess you could say that. A skinwalker, a tall, faceless man, and I even killed this one guy who placed a contract on this one girl's head. It was actually with this. He pulled out a knife from his pocket, flicking it out. It was clean, not a scratch on it, and had a slight blue tint to it. Unfortunately, no matter how far I dug, I was never able to find the murderer. That was until the faceless guy I mentioned came into my office. It's a bit of a long story, but it turns out the murderer was already dead. Happened a few months or so after I started looking into the case. Goddamn. So, are you trying to find whoever murdered him then? He scoff laughed. No. Lately, I've been digging into all the police and political corruption. Hell, I used to be a detective until I looked into that murderer. Shit hit the fan pretty fast, and now that the murder is solved, I'm trying to fix this fucked up state. But I gotta take on some side jobs to keep myself alive long enough to at least find the source of everything. So, I assume that's why you needed me then, and why you're so willing to help me find Griselda. Yeah, essentially. Do you know how hard it is to find humans who have legitimate experience with the supernatural? I can't just Craigslist this shit. I need people with experience, because I can't have novices in this life trying to figure out how to cope with their worldview collapsing. I know how hard it is on your mental state, and I'd rather not be the reason people have to live with something like that. We sat in silence for a few minutes. So, you aren't quite as heartless as I thought. He side-eyed me in response. I, I just mean... If you don't have to put innocent people in a bad situation, then you won't. I think that's commendable, considering you're still willing to do the dirty work when push comes to shove. One thing you'll learn working for me, you're going to need to have flexible morals. Because ultimately, I just want answers. I wondered. Did he realize he's actually working toward the greater good? Or was he legitimately oblivious he was actually a good person? If a little chaotic... I didn't dare speak the thought out loud, considering the look he'd given me before. As the minutes passed, Simmons turned up his piano music, tapping his finger along with the rhythm. While I couldn't get into it, I respected how he didn't give a shit what I thought. The rest of the drive was mostly silence, only being broken to make passing comments and the like. Once we'd finally made it, Simmons shut off the car, got out, and headed to the back. I followed suit and we hopped in, getting dressed for the crimes we were about to commit. He had a few extra sets, which I assumed were backups in case anything unexpected happened. As we made our way to the garden area, Simmons made a call. Hey, yeah, Jeremy, it's me. We can talk about this later. I already sent you the money. I need you to take out the security we talked about for Dusk Blue Psychiatric Hospital. Yeah, fifteen should be plenty. All right. Ring me when they're down. By this point, we were waiting by a fence toward the back. Once his phone buzzed, we got to hopping it. Once I'd landed, Simmons handed me a taser, then whispered, Just in case you run into any guards, but we should be fine as long as we finish in the 15 minutes we've got. Let's go. He took the lead, taking us through the garden. Opening the door to the central building, we headed to the right, managing to pass by every guard undetected before finally reaching her room. You head in, talk to her, and try to convince her in five. I nodded, heading inside. She was asleep. She looked so peaceful, and as much as I didn't want to, I was about to terrify her. Even if she recognized me, I was dressed in all black, so even whispering until she woke up would scare her. I only had one option, and it was a pretty shitty one. I covered her mouth, waking her up by whispering her name right into her ear. 
She tried to scream and fight me, but it seemed she hadn't been training as much since getting put in there. I tried to get her to focus on my face, and after a minute, she finally calmed down. Slowly, I removed my hand from her mouth. Her eyes were still wide, but she spoke. Xavier, you're not real. She squeezed her eyes shut, tears beginning to form. Go away. Just leave me alone. No, it's me. Listen, I came to get you. I looked at her. She was absolutely terrified, on the verge of a mental breakdown. You're, um, you're scared right now, aren't you? The tears began streaming as she opened her eyes again. Just leave me alone. I don't want anything to do with you. I'm finally getting better. Please, just leave. Her pupils seemed to vibrate as they shrunk before she squeezed her eyes shut again. You're not real. One side of her knew I was real. The other wanted to believe I was a mere figment. She was torn between two strong beliefs, and the truth stabbed at my heart repeatedly. My conscious and subconsciousness waged war for what the right call was. I was so certain that pulling her out of here would be best for her. But now, seeing as she fought off screaming with tears and denial, I couldn't say I knew what was best for her. Whether I should bring her with me and let her realize everything she had seen was real, or let her believe it was all in her head, and eventually rejoin society as a normal person. I stared her right in the eyes as they fluttered open again. A look of both recognition and incomprehension stared back at me, piercing my soul. Do you want to believe I'm real? I... I want you to leave. That's not what I asked. Tell me, right here and now, do you want me to be real or not? She hesitated. No, 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 I just want to be normal again. I want to feel human again. All right, all right, quiet down. I understand. I just want you to know. My eyes began watering and my throat tightened. You were the best friend I ever had. As the last tear rolled down her cheek, I wiped it away. Don't cry anymore. There's no need to. I never existed in the first place. Goodbye. With that, I stood, walking out of her room, tears rolling down my face. Let's go. I shuddered, closing the door behind me. He looked me in the eyes and sighed. I heard the commotion. Well, I understand you owe me big time for the favor I pulled for this shit. He turned, and we began running down the hallway. At one point, a guard saw us, but before he could follow, Simmons and I pulled our tasers out and charged him. Once we were sure he was out of commission, we picked up speed, sprinting the whole way to the fence. We both lunged, climbing the fence faster than I thought possible. The entire way to the van, I thought about her, the way she looked at me as if I were a close friend, yet a complete stranger. It was terrifying, and I just couldn't justify forcing her to come with us. As we hopped the fence, as we sprinted to the van, I almost felt like giving up, the only thing pushing me along being the guard yelling at us from the entrance. We eventually made it back to the van, and sped off before anyone could see where we'd parked. He still sped most of the way out of town, but when we'd finally reached the city limits, he slowed down to the speed limit. As I gazed longingly out the window, still questioning if I'd made the right call, he interrupted my thoughts. As much as I hate how you treated that whole situation, I can't say you didn't pull your own weight. I'm not sure what all happened back there, but now you're going to have to work for me until you at least pay off the favor I called in. He paused for a minute, then held out a hand. So, I guess... Welcome to Apex Investigators. Officially, that is. 
feel free to call me Jones.